resign his position from the Cape Zoning Board um, as a result of his pending applications uh, before the Zoning and Planning Board. Uh, so it is with some regret that we accept uh, Joe's resignation and thank him for the service that he has uh, rendered to the Zoning Board over the years. So our board tonight um, consists of six board members, um, all of whom are present. Next item on the agenda is to approve the minutes of our August 28, 2001 meeting. Comments from board members on the August 28 minutes. Um, I just have a couple of very small items. Um, Sandy, do you have, do you have a copy of those? Um, on page two, line 23, actually, I think we have to go up to line 22 to read that sentence. It says, she stated that since the addition would be no closer than the existing is at present. I think the, uh, we're missing a word there, and I think the missing word is house. No closer than the existing house is at present. Um, then on page three, line 33, it says there was much, some discussion introduced by Mr. Keneally. I think we should have either the word much or the word some. Uh, but not both. Um, I would suggest that it was much discussion rather than some. So I would suggest we strike the word some. Um, and those are the only comments I have. Um, any other comments on the minutes? Uh, could I have a motion on the minutes, please? Move we approve the minutes as amended. Uh, motion, Mr. Keneally. Um, a second? I'll second them. Uh, Mr. LaPlante. Uh, discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Opposed? Were you abstaining? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. I, 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 yes, I should have abstained. Uh, no, I wasn't asking. If oh, you were, no, I just didn't see your hand. Okay, sorry. Um, the minutes are approved uh, by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. But the minutes do reflect that Ms. Miller uh, did not sit as a board member during a portion of the August 28 hearing. Next item on the agenda is old business. Um, the only item of old business that I'd like to raise is that the minutes do reflect that there was discussion at the last meeting about holding a workshop to discuss the feasibility, practicality, and legality of the board imposing conditions on variance uh, approvals. Um, has there been any attempt to try and schedule a workshop? Um, Tentatively, if, if it's, if it's uh, all right with the board, it'll be uh, October 15th at 6 p.m., which is a Monday night. October 15th. That'll work. It's a Monday night? It's Monday night. With all the usual fanfare, Domino's pizzas, and tape at, tips. At six o'clock, Mr. Hill, are you available for that? Yeah. Okay. Well, we will plan on a workshop on October fifteenth, uh, two thousand one, on Monday evening at six o'clock. Um, I'll and I'll, I'll determine where the meeting will be held. I'll send out. I'll send out a notice. Great. Thank you, Bruce. Next item on the agenda is new business. We have three items of new business. The first is to hear the administrative appeal of Glenn and Marguerite Prentice, agreed from the decision of Code Enforcement Officer Bruce Smith to issue building permit number 020020 to Paul Vos for construction of a foundation for a single family dwelling at 20 Ocean Avenue, tax map U17. Lot 7A. 
are the apprentices here. Um, I'm sorry. The answer is yes. Uh, Dr. Prentice is here, and uh, my name is James Haddow. I'm the attorney for the apprentices. Okay, before we get started on this, <coughs> Mr. Haddow, I um, need to make a couple of disclosures personally on this matter uh, before it's heard. Um, and under Section 3A6 of the local um, of the board's rules it says if a question of possible conflict of interest is raised the member with a potential conflict shall make full disclosure um, I personally do not know Mr. Vos um, is he here tonight I don't believe I've ever met Mr. Vos um, I am a member of the law firm of Hopkinson Abendanzen Backer uh, Mr. Vos, at some time in the past, um, has sought legal advice uh, from my office um, related to this matter, um, at least tangentially. Um, to the best of my knowledge, my firm was not formally engaged. I certainly did not render any advice to him. Um, also, on the lot in question, We have, at least as part of our packet, a notice issued by the Cape uh, Planning Board dated May 22, 1996, um, that made a number of findings uh, that determined that the lot in question uh, was part of a recorded subdivision and that the state of Maine had granted a waiver of the minimum lot size and had approved a septic design for the lot. That letter is addressed to James Hopkinson, who is my law partner. Um, that letter was written before he was my law partner, um, but just the same, um, although I don't think there's a direct conflict, I do want to avoid any possible appearance of impropriety, um, and for that reason, um, I'm not going to participate in this, um, and I'm going to stand down and let, um, pursuant to the rules, the uh, board secretary, uh, Mr. Keneally, uh, resume the duties as chairs for this, for this portion of the hearing. Um, let me also, in the interest of full disclosure, make known that um, Mr. Vos uh, was a partner of the contractor that built my house three years ago. So we have had a business relationship in the past. Um, however, it was an arm's length business relationship, and I personally don't feel any uh, reason to believe it should influence me one way or the other, but I'll leave that up to the rest of the board to uh, see if they affirm that. Feel free to state your opinion if you feel that's enough of a. Uh, appearance of conflict of interest for me to step down as well. Were you happy with the work performed? Yeah. yeah. I personally don't see any conflict. If, if you're able to sit here and say that you're going to be unbiased, then I'm comfortable with that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we'll proceed then. Uh, is uh, Mr. or Mrs. Prentice, our representative here, that would like to make a statement? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Board of Appeals. I understand that you all have a packet that includes written arguments that have been presented on uh, Prentice's behalf by, uh, by my office, and I gather that you also have the opinion of the Excuse, excuse me, are you Bruce McLaughlin? Or? No, I'm Jim Haddo. Uh, Bruce McLaughlin works with me. Could you spell your last name, please? <coughs> My last name is spelled H-A-D-D-O-W. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> uh, I will not uh, take the board's time reiterating the written arguments that we have already presented. There were, however, two issues that were raised by Mr in his letter that I wanted to address directly uh, on behalf of Prentices. First of all, uh, as uh, Mr. Backer pointed out, there is attached to the package that Mr. Hill put together a letter from the planning board that makes a couple of findings uh, in relation to uh, the lot that's in question here. Uh, 
the suggestion in Mr. Hill's letter is that that planning board finding may be preclusive of any challenge to the legality of the lot that could be raised now. I just want to point out two things about that that I think suggest the, the contrary. First of all, that application that was an issue there was an application for a public access waiver. It was not an application for a building permit. As far as we know, there was no application for a building permit that was made at that time. And uh, for that reason, uh, the, this issue was not squarely before the board. And in fact, the finding of the board was not that this is a legal lot, but simply that the lot was part of an approved subdivision at one time, or it's part of a subdivision plan that was recorded, and also that it was uh, granted a waiver by the state uh, for minimum lot size purposes. Those two facts are true, but not this positive in this case of whether this lot is legal or not. Second, uh, I want to point out that the lot at the time was owned by Mr. Tinsman. The abutters were a different group of people, and no action was ever taken on that public access waiver. So to suggest that somehow that event that occurred then on which no action was taken is preclusive of a challenge now when a building permit has finally been applied for is, uh, I think, wrong as a matter of law. It certainly would be a dangerous precedent to set. Say, for example, uh, one owner goes and applies for a building permit. There's no challenge. The building permit issues, and no building is ever constructed. The building permit lapses. The owner sells the land new abutters move in, there's a new building permit application for the same piece of land. The abutters realize that there's a problem. They timely raise their objection. Clearly, the issuance of the old building permit years ago that's now expired to a prior owner doesn't preclude a current challenge. And that's comparable to what's being done here and now. There was no, uh, there was no challenge at the time to the, uh, to the public access waiver. But that doesn't preclude a challenge now to the issuance of the building permit. Uh, could I point out there's one other aspect? You, you basically read part of this letter from Janet McKay, acting planning board chair. Uh, paragraph number two also says that an, an approved a septic system was approved for that lot as well. Correct. That was the, that was the state minimum lot size waiver that I right. that I referred to. Right. Um, but in any event, yes, that's correct. But. None of, those, uh, none of those events, including the, the septic waiver, uh, are preclusive at this point, because no, no action was ever taken on any of those things. No trying to be complete. The other issue that uh, Mr. Hill raises uh, in his letter that I wanted to address, because I think it, is, it, it does depart from the arguments that we made, is that, the, uh, that even if our argument on the effect of the plain language of the ordinance is correct. Even if at the time Mr. Tinsman deeded the lot to Mr. Vos, that lot was an illegal lot. Mr. Hill says that's essentially been mooted by virtue of the ordinance change that was effective on July 4th of this year, which provides that if a developed lot, if a developed non-conforming lot abuts an undeveloped non-conforming lot held in the same ownership, the lots may be separated and owned independently. Mr. Hill's argument is, even if we're right, that's cured simply by the lots re-merging and Mr. Tinsman re-deeding the lot to Mr. Vost. Unfortunately for, for Mr. Vost, that can't happen today because the original lot that was owned by Mr. Tinsman is now, as I understand it, no longer owned by Mr. Tinsman. And it is also not necessarily a foregone conclusion that even if those lots re-merged, Mr. Tinsman would or could re-deed the lot that Mr. Vost now has to him. So it's not accurate to say that the amendment of July 4th of this year moots this issue. If, in fact, our argument is correct, and I understand that Mr. Hill disagrees with it, but if our argument is correct, and in fact that lot was illegal at the time it was created, then this board should make that ruling and if Mr. Vos has been able to somehow or other reconfigure these things in accordance with the ordinance change of July 4th, that's up to him. He may or may not be able to do that, but the effect wouldn't, wouldn't change. The immediate effect is that lot's illegal, and the, the, there's no suggestion here that the July 4th change undid the illegality of that original transfer. 
I don't have any further uh, remarks. If there are questions, I'd be glad to take them. Otherwise, I'll cede the floor to Mr. Hill or to Mr. Bolster, whoever is speaking next. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Mike, would you like to address that? Thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Hill. I'm with uh, Monaghan Leahy and I'm representing the board here tonight. Um, I just want to respond to a couple of the points raised by Mr. Hanna. My reference to the planning board decision was to point out that, the, that it was a lot in an approved sub subdivision and had received the state minimum lot size waiver. Um, it, it's not for the proposition that it's a, a buildable lot. That was not before the planning board, although I, I'll just add that code enforcement officer would not send it to the planning board as a general rule, wouldn't send it to the planning board if the lot, if in, in the uh, code enforcement officer's opinion, that the lot was not a buildable lot. So you would only send to the planning board a lot that you uh, otherwise met the requirements for a building permit except for the public access waiver. And the, we haven't had a public access waiver in effect for a long time, so I don't think that anyone on this board had to deal with that old ordinance. But um, So, I, I mean, it's not dispositive that it's a buildable lot, but it is dispositive, I believe, uh, for those two issues, which I think I, I heard Mr. Haddow say that he concedes those two issues anyway, that it, there's a lot on approved subdivision and had received the state minimum lot size waiver. Um, that with respect to the timeliness of an appeal from the planning board's grant of a public access waiver, uh, our old ordinance did not have an expiration for a public access waiver. There was no expiration period for that, as opposed to a building permit, which does have an expiration period and becomes null and void if if no action is taken. And so that person has no uh, vested rights in a building permit. And I think that Mr. Haddow's example is, is exactly right. If a lot owner got a bu building permit, never acted on it, it lapsed, became null and void, the lot changes hands, or the abutting property owners mm -hmm. change hand, and another building permit is applied for, and the new abutter says, hey, wait a minute, you don't, you don't meet some requirement. Um, I do not think that the earlier granting of that building permit means that the code enforcement officer has to grant the building permit today if, if he finds that there is a problem. So I, I don't disagree with what Mr. Haddow was saying, but I do think that a public access waiver is different. There was no expiration uh, period for that. Now, our ordinance has changed in the meantime. I, I also disagree with Mr. Haddow with respect to the mootness issue because uh, although I, under I do understand that the Tinsmans do not own that lot, what would, if, if it was illegal to divide, to sell Mr. Vos that lot, then it also makes the lot retained by Tinsman, and I'm not sure who owns that now, uh, it, it could make that a... Uh, an illegal lot as well, and I, d I don't know, but um, I, I understand that those two lots combined today would still not meet the minimum lot size. Is that correct? The two lots which, That's which were retained by Mr. Gordon? So it, it becomes a complicated uh, matter to reform a deed. It would require court action, enforcement by the town, and a reformation of a deed, and we'd end up in the same place. I envision that the court order would be Mr. Vos, you convey it back to Mr. Tinsman, whoever owns the Tinsman's house, conveys it back to Mr. Tinsman, then he turns around and, and uh, convey, conveys it back to these people. And it's really, in my uh, view, uh, a useless act. It's a moot point. We could go to court and we could probably get that, but it's a moot, moot point at, at this time with the current zoning ordinance, which would allow uh, this conveyance today. I'd be happy to go through uh, section 19.3.2, uh, the old section 19.3.2, if you wish. I did make copies of the old ordinance. I don't know whether you have copies of those uh, in your packet or not, but um, 
I, I really think that it, it's a moot point. The board could decide that it's a moot point, go on and uh, uh, look at the factual uh, determinations made by the code enforcement officer, uh, and then make your decision. Your, your advice is that to the board is that um, it is a legally existing, not common law. Yes. Okay. Mr. Smith, can I ask you a question? Um, I don't know whether or not a building permit was ever granted before, but following up on something Mr. Hill said, um, if one was granted before, would that have influenced your approval of the current uh, building permit? Were you in, well, let me ask you a question. Were you influenced at all by a pre-existing building permit? No, as a matter of fact, I, I uh, denied, or I, I told Mr. Bowles that he was not eligible for building permit prior to the, this recent change. Okay. Because the ordinance prior to 90, uh, 99 did not allow um, a lot less than 20,000 square feet to go okay. to the state and get a minimum lot size waiver, as the old ordinance did prior to 97. Okay. That, that what happened is the council brought that back into the ordinance because they felt that was an omission, okay. and which opened, which cleared the way for a building permit to be issued. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else on the board have any questions yeah, for Mr. Hill? Can you, can you help us understand a little bit more the, the section you pointed out, 1943A2? I think that's the crux of this, and I want to make sure I'm interpreting it properly. It's the new provision. That would allow this conveyance today? Right. Okay. Um, 1942, well, 1943, A, to C, on the bottom of page 34, and then over onto the top of page 35. It's really on the top of page 35 that the uh, language is contained. If a developed non-conforming lot abuts an undeveloped non-conforming uh, non lot held in the same ownership, the lots may be separated and owned independently. Uh, and the, in the figures below, the last one on that page corresponds with that. So the, uh, I'll just call it the Tinsman lot with the building on it, uh, was a non-conforming lot. It didn't meet the current uh, square footage requirements. And that was developed. And I'll, just, I'll call it the Vos lot. The Vos lot was a vacant, uh, undeveloped, non-conforming uh, lot held in common ownership. If, if, that, if the Tinsman owned, owned all those lots today, they could sell off the undeveloped, non-conforming lot. They could convey that out. So the very transaction which occurred in 96 would be allowed today. And it's also my opinion that it was allowed in 96 as well. And there, and there just to keep talking, uh, there certainly was a period of time uh, from 97 till July 4, 2001, when this, this conveyance would not have been allowed. But it's our opinion that it was allowed in 96. It wouldn't have been allowed by the 97 ordinance. It is allowed by the July 4, 2001. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Hill. Um, is there anyone else that would like to speak in this public part of this hearing? To identify yourself, please. Uh, good evening. My name is Paul Vos, and I own the lot which you're discussing tonight, the uh, vacant lot. And um, I guess I, I would just like to say that uh, I am confident, and I 
say that because that my lot was separated correctly in 1995, 1996, uh, because I was part of that process from, I believe, 1993 up until 1996 while this lot was being uh, granted its approvals from the state and from the town in order to be recognized as a potentially buildable lot. And um, I met with the then code enforcement officer on a number of occasions and discussed the ordinance with him that was in effect. And, and in fact, that provision was used previous to my use of it by other properties in town to develop vacant non-conforming lots, which abutted developed non-conforming lots. Um, and so I think that the pre-1997 ordinance very much allowed me to do what was done and which was done in the full view of the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board and written as such by that planning board and by the town planner. And I believe the 19, I'm sorry, the 2001 ordinance <coughs> is as clear about it as well. So I hope you will uh, allow me to continue with my construction on my property. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions for Mr. Votes from the board? Thank you, Mr. Votes. One other thing that someone asked. We, we're considering a building permit. What are you building? I assume residential structure? Single family house. Single. Yes. And I did not. Is it two story or one story? I don't have a plan really for the house at this time. Um, this has been uh, somewhat of an issue uh, with the people who have brought the appeal this evening. So um, I uh, expected this. Um, so I uh, applied for this building permit um, as soon as the ordinance was um, in effect. Uh, the correction was made to our ordinance. Um, and. Uh, that's why we're here tonight, I guess. And as far as when I first purchased the lot about a building permit, I think you asked it, Mr. Keneally, I did not apply for a building permit because I did not have plans to build on that lot for some time. I bought the lot with um, future plans to live there. I was not in a position to do it at that time. When did, when did you first apply for a building permit? Um, it was either July or, or uh, August of this year. There was a building permit that was um, in the file that was never acted on back in 95 or 96, but that was just more to get the process going of, for the town to tell us what we needed to do to be able to obtain that permit. Thank you. <clears throat> Is there anyone else who would like to speak either for or against this matter from the public? Seeing none, the public session is closed. Um, any, any comments from the board as far as feelings about this matter? I just have, um, I, it wasn't our decision, but the recent amendment that the planning board and the town council have considered, um, which addressed this issue, I thought kind of went to these, exactly this issue. Uh, I, I was just looking for some input from folks on the board as to why they think that this wouldn't, this new amendment wouldn't apply to this case as um, the apprentices have pointed out. Um, well, I think that the attorney for Mr. Vos was arguing that um, you couldn't reconstruct things today because the abutting lot's not owned by the original owner, so. No, right, I understand his, his uh, his arguments. I, I'm just. <coughs> is this exactly what we were trying to address, though? I was left with the impression that the ordinance, as it stands today, in reinforces the transactions that occurred, and that. I, that's my feeling too. Yeah. It, it seems that that non-conforming lot is indeed a buildable lot. I believe that's the counsel of Mr. Hill to us as well. And I am concerned about that, as <coughs> Mr. Hill's pointed out, the transactional. Even though it's messier to trans transfer the land to somebody who didn't originally own it and then transfer it back, that, that exercise is possible. Um, it's messy, yes, but it is possible. And it involves um, the agreement of all the parties as well, which may not be forthcoming. 
Absolutely, and that's something. Theoretically, it is possible. Yeah. Mr. Keneally, I, I, my feelings on this matter is that we were asked uh, to appeal Mr. Smith's uh, decision this evening. And I think taking the information presented by our counsel, Mr. Hill, which I, I concur with that the permit should have been uh, granted, uh, I think we should take a look. We have a copy of the original permit dated July 12th uh, to make sure that the information in that is factual. And by looking at the setbacks for the foundation, both front sides and rear, uh, does appear to be an occurrence with the present statute. So my feelings are, I think, uh, there's, there's no merit to the appeal at this point. I'm confused by something. However, our packet con contained a copy of the building permit, yet no plans. There was only a foundation uh, permit issue. This was just for foundation. Isn't the building permit kind of the last step of the approval process? I mean, when when some plans need to be reviewed in terms of uh, compliance with setbacks and, and other issues? The, the foundation w was found to be in compliance with setbacks, but there isn't okay. building plans because the foundation is the only thing that was applied for and approved um, because of the potential appeal. Um, I assume the applicant wanted to bring it through and then formulate his plans after the appeal process, if so the successful. Build, the building permit, as it exists today, is simply for the foundation. Correct. No other construction. And then another building permit would be issued for the domicile. That's correct. Any other discussion by the board? Would anyone on the board like to make a motion? To Do we have any indication of the final uh, house at this point, or is that at all necessary? The final dwelling that's going to be developed, is that at all indicated as, as part of the foundation plan? I'm sorry, I didn't catch all of it. Is as part of the foundation building permit that's been approved, is there any indication of the final dwelling structure at this time? in with your office? No. I guess all we know is that it was a, through it uh, applied for as a foundation for a three bedroom house, a septic tank of 1,000 gallons. Here to make a motion. I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Right. Um, in the matter of the administrative appeal of Glenn and Marguerite Prentice, referencing building permit number 020020 uh, for a construction of a foundation of a single family dwelling at 20 Ocean Avenue, tax map U17. Lot 7A. That the aforementioned appeal be denied. Is there a second to that motion? Yes, motion has been seconded. Motion to deny the administrative appeal of one of Marguerite Prentice has been raised and seconded. Uh, raise your hand if you. What the motion? Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. If I might uh, interrupt, you may wish to uh, uh, put a little uh, meat on the motion uh, as to why it's uh, being, uh, why the appeal is being denied. Okay. Um, and it, if you <coughs> felt that the, uh, uh, as a legal issue, the matter of whether it was a non conforming lot was moot. You could put that into the motion, and if you find that the uh, foundation meets the setback requirements and that the lot meets the minimum lot size and so forth, 
I think those should be included in the motion as well, as a, as a finding. Thank you. Mr. Trent Begley, would you like to take a crack at that? Take another crack at it, uh, yes. In the, <clears throat> in the matter of the administrative appeal of Glenn and Marguerite Prentice, uh, with reference to the issuing of building permit number 020020 for construction of a foundation of a single family dwelling at 20 Ocean Avenue, tax MAC, U17, lot 7A. Um, he denied after the following findings of fact. Uh, this board found that the building permit contained factual information in setbacks within uh, present statute as well as would you would you care to consider adding in the, some wording Please. that the lot was a legally existing non-conforming lot at the time of the transfer and also as of today. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Do I have a second for the amended motion? I'll second that one as well. Okay. All those in favor, please raise your hand. It's five to zero. Uh, the application is denied. And, uh, <coughs> business and Mr. Backer will return. The next item on our agenda is to hear the appeal of Joseph A. Fristasi, 8 Rosewood Drive, tax map U34, lot 22-4, for rear and side property line variances of five feet from the required 20 feet for lots within the proposed 19 lot Blueberry Ridge subdivision. Good evening. My name is Joe Fristacci. I am the applicant. With me tonight is Richard Manthorn, my engineer, and Jim Haddow, my attorney, and we'll be available to uh, answer questions, hopefully make a presentation that you can understand. Mr. Fristacci, before you get started, let me make note of a few items that we have received as of this evening to make sure that um, you are aware of them, and you are represented here tonight by council also? Yes, I am. Um, and to make sure that your council is aware of them. Um, I have received a letter dated September 24, addressed to me uh, by Lee Bumstead. I have a letter dated September 24, 2001 addressed to me from a Thomas Peterson that has a one-page attachment to the two-page letter. And I was um, handed tonight immediately prior to the hearing 
a letter dated September 25 that is eight pages uh, from Robert Crawford um, as legal counsel for David and Elizabeth Sawyer, Marion and Tom Peterson, and Yolanda Fogg. That is an eight-page letter with a one-page attachment. And I simply want to make sure that you are aware of our receipt of those and that your council has them also. Yes, we uh, also received those this evening. Okay, thank you. Make sure um, I, for the for the file, we I never got a copy of Sawyer's letter, so. Well, I have an extra copy of it, so if you can pass this down um, to have that letter included as part of the file. Now, I, let me may I make a comment, Mr. Backer. Wait. Um, of course you can. Were you referring, Bruce, to Mr. Crawford's letter? Is that what you were asking for? I was. Sorry. This is the one. From the law firm of Bernstein, Sheriff right. Sawyer, Nelson? Okay. Mr. Keneally. I just want to make a comment that as of now, I don't believe anyone on the board has had time to read this eight-page letter. Um, well, as of now, I haven't read any of the three letters that I That's referred true, to. Yeah. So, so that is clear to everybody. Um, I certainly haven't read them. I just saw them for the first time coming into the hearing tonight, um, and I assume that uh, none of the other board members have had an opportunity to read them. Correct. Mr. Frusassi. Okay, thank you. Um, when I was sitting on the board several months ago, I questioned why a planning board issue would come to the zoning board. And it's explained, or was explained to me by Maureen O'Mara. The planning board, she's the town planner for those that aren't familiar. The planning board wants to have all the variances that may be necessary in place before they review a subdivision. Now, there were two that I can remember when I was on the board, St. Albans Church and St. Bartholomew's Church came in to ask for um, variances and approval for what they were planning to do. So that when they got to the planning board, everything was in place, and all the plans and the reports and efforts wouldn't be wasted based on a technicality that they didn't have the side setback or the rear setbacks that were necessary. So having said that, There are a couple of things that I want to establish. One, you're here not to review the merits of the Blueberry Ridge subdivision, but the request for the variance. There are two requests. The first one we'll take separately, and that is the side and rear setbacks. I'm here tonight because of a long history of situations that we, that I've experienced. I purchased the property in 1991 and got, re, um, got approvals for phase one of Rosewood one back in 1992. In 1994, I started the second phase. The uh, second phase basically was going to access land from, uh, access the land on the South Portland side of the 16 acres that I uh, was planning to develop. The purpose for developing it over there is mainly because of the two roads that access the land and the suitability of the land itself. This is a plan that was devised in 1996 and it was presented to the, the planning board, um, the planning board workshop at that time. However, there were several obstacles that we had to overcome. One, the neighbors in South Portland were concerned about accessing the land from South Portland. Two, we had a boundary dispute. We didn't know whether the land actually was, was in South Portland or Cape Elizabeth. And 
The other obstacle that uh, recently popped up is the zoning ordinance or the subdivision ordinance changed. So what we have now is no, no longer Rosewood 2, but we have Blueberry Ridge subdivision. Rosewood 2 basically terminated when South Portland vacated the two streets that accessed the land. So tonight we're bringing before you the Blueberry Ridge subdivision, which is accessed from South Portland. Excuse me. <laughs> accessed from, from uh, Cape Elizabeth Mitchell Road and winds or basically extends its way through to the suitable land on the South Portland side. I'll have Jim Haddo, my attorney, argue the technical merits of the application and uh, the reason why we're here asking for the, um, a five-foot side and rear setback on the 19-lot um, subdivision known as Blueberry Ridge. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, once again, I know that you have the written application that was submitted by Mr. Fristacci, so I will try to be brief in uh, outlining the support that uh, exists in the ordinance for the application that Mr. Fristacci has made. First, let me say that uh, we understand that it is the opinion of your town's council that because of the Perkins versus Agunquit law court decision of 1998, the planning board does not have authority to reduce side line and rear line setbacks below the minimum setback requirements in the underlying district, even though the plain language of the open spaces portion of the ordinance suggests that it can do that all the way down to five feet. So, the reason that we're here is because we recognize that if we went directly to the planning board with this request, the planning board wouldn't have, author pardon, wouldn't have authority to grant it, even though it's obviously contemplated by the ordinance. The obvious policy decision that was made here by the municipal legislative body is that there is to be flexibility afforded to developers who elect to, to create developments under the open spaces portion of the ordinance. The idea is that is to be favored. Uh, there is, there's been a policy decision made that development that creates open space and uses smaller lot sizes is to be preferred and that when a developer comes to the planning board with that sort of a plan, there's to be a certain amount of flexibility afforded to the developer in building. Mr. Hedo, do you agree with the opinion of uh, Mr. Hill that the Cape Planning Board uh, does not have the authority to reduce um, the setbacks below 20 feet? Uh, I believe that is a correct interpretation of the Perkins versus Agunquit case. I think that's correct. I think that um, even though the ordinance obviously intended a different result, because, the, because the, this, this, uh, your open space zoning is, is, is treated like an overlay, uh, permitting the planning board to reduce lot uh, setbacks below what is required in the underlying zone would be tantamount to permitting the planning board to grant a variance, which is clearly impermissible. So at least as, as that case, the Perkins versus the Gunkwood case has decided, and that is the law of the state, obviously, at this point, uh, I think Mr. Hill is correct that uh, the planning board doesn't, uh, it's a correct interpretation of that case. So you agree that you're in the right place, at least? Yes, yeah. I, for what we, you're asking for? Yes, correct. I, I believe we are in the right place. Uh, and the question is simply whether we are, th th whether this board is uh, prepared to carry out, uh, is to act in accordance with the application that we've made. But yes, I, that's, that's my opinion okay, as well. Thank you. Uh, so that's why we're here in any event. And 
So the, the first issue uh, which is presented by a variance application here, which is whether the application presents um, a proposal that's consistent with the intent of the ordinance. Clearly, this is consistent with the intent of the ordinance. It's absolutely clear that this is exactly what the open spaces portion of the ordinance had in mind, was that there would be some flexibility on sidelight setbacks all the way down to five feet. And it's also clear that the section regarding uh, uh, building envelope setbacks, which doesn't appear other places, there is no, there is no underlying minimum for for building envelope setbacks. So that's not before the board at this point. We haven't made any application concerning building envelope setbacks, assuming that that even applies here. We've taken the position that it doesn't. That's not before the board in any event. The question here is whether this application conforms in other ways with the requirements of, the, uh, uh, of a variance. Now, Cape Elizabeth, as I know you are well aware, prescribes to the practical difficulty standard in evaluating variances. And again, we start with whether there's a substantial departure from the intent of the ordinance. Clearly, that's not the case. This is clearly consistent with the intent of the ordinance. Uh, so the next section, which is the practical difficulty section, focuses on whether there's a significant economic injury to the property owner. And significant economic, pardon me, significant economic injury is defined in turn as placing the applicant for a variance at a disadvantage in the neighborhood by applying zoning ordinance standards which would prevent the applicant from having a structure or accessory structure comparable in size, location, and number to those of other lot owners in the immediate neighborhood, but in no case fewer than 10 of the nearest property owners. Now, Mr. Prestacci has presented you with information concerning the abutting properties and how they are built, and it's quite clear that a significant number of them certainly uh, based on the material that he's presented, 10 or more, uh, are built uh, to standards that are considerably less stringent than the 15-foot setbacks that are being requested here. Uh, there are setbacks, sideline and rear line setbacks that are consistently under 15 feet in the abutting properties. Uh, I believe that, I'm sorry, did you have a question? Yeah, where are the abutting properties? Are they on this map? The, the abutting properties, I, I believe that um, Mr. Fristacci has provided you with a plan. Um. The abutting properties, you, you have uh, another map, I think, that preceded this one? Yeah. Yes. I know, but I think the, I'm thinking where they are in relation to the house. Ah, well, the, if, if you look at if you orient your that that plan so that the Charlotte Road Charlotte Road I believe is indicated on on the plan so that you can orient it so that it compares with this. Okay, so where's the subject property that we're considering? The, the subject property is, is are are the the lots that you see on this plan. We're talking about one one through 19, with the exception for the moment, well, 12 is also under consideration, but there's another issue with respect to 12 that we'll get to. Okay, so I should like lift that off and almost drop Just it. Just so, yes, qu exactly That's so. What I can figure out. Exactly so. Is that, is that all right? That makes more sense. Okay, shall I go on? All right. Um, Again, uh, the, the, the next criterion is that the need of the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general circumstances of the neighborhood. I believe that you'll have an opportunity to hear from Mr. Manthorne about the, the planning of this subdivision, but part at least of what you'll hear is that there have been a number of iterations of this plan. And at this point, by virtue of the nature of the land it sits on and by virtue of the actions of the city of South Portland, there is essentially no alternative no practical alternative to the plan that's been, that's been prepared. It is as it needs to be. Uh, and so it really is not, uh, it's not something that's happened as a consequence of choices uh, that Mr. Fristacci has made so much as uh, the requirements of the 
geographical characteristics, physical characteristics of the property, and the limitations on access um, that have come about uh, as a consequence of the, the uh, discontinuance of the two South Portland points of access. Uh, the third, I'm sorry, the fourth criterion is the uh, character of the neighborhood. Again, uh, to the extent there is a neighborhood here to look at, the neighborhood is in South Portland. It is a densely built neighborhood, at least as densely built, probably more densely built than what is being proposed by Mr. Fustacci. Uh, so the, the character of the neighborhood shouldn't be affected uh, in, in any way, certainly not negatively. Uh, and again, under four, there are a number of subsidiary criteria. Uh, and again, blocking established views, there are none. Posing a fire safety hazard, there's no suggestion that he's done that. Casting a shadow on an adjoining lot, again, no evidence to suggest anything like that. Reducing the appraised value of an adjoining property by 10% or more, there is certainly no evidence of that. I have gone quickly through the submissions that the board has seen so far tonight, and there's nothing there to suggest that uh, Let's put it this way, there's no credible evidence to suggest that uh, adjoining property values would be reduced by any particular amount. Um, again, because of the close, uh, the close uh, development of the existing neighborhood, be, I think anyone would be hard-pressed to argue that there would be a significant uh, reduction in privacy. These houses are already cheek by jowl, the ones that are there. Um, Again, uh, number five is sort of the flip side of number three, I think. Uh, the practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or prior owner. Uh, once again, um, the, this approach to the development is the one that makes sense given the characteristics of the property and the actions of City South Portland. Uh, it's not a result of, uh, of anything in particular that Mr. Fristacci has done. Uh, and at this point, uh, there isn't any alternative. Uh, these building envelopes, without the variance, many of the building envelopes are, are uh, no more than 50 by 50. It, it gives uh, very, very little room to make a decision about where on the lot a house is going to be placed as opposed to other utilities and that sort of thing. So it's really a 50 by 50 uh, building envelope is, is pretty uh, restrictive. Um, the, uh, the whole idea behind this uh, mode of construction, the open spaces development, is that it is uh, a favorable choice for the environment. So criterion seven, which is that the granting of a variance will not unreasonably adversely affect the natural environment, I think is an easy one. Uh, and the property is not located in whole or in part within shoreland areas. That's item eight. Clearly, that is not the case. So again, as you go down through and tick off the, the various criteria, uh, the evidence before the board uh, compels the conclusion that this application meets all of those criteria and that the variance is appropriate. I'd be glad to take any questions from the board if there are questions. Um, how many house lots were in the subdivision as originally laid out on the first drawing shown by Mr. Fashion? Um, I believe that the original, well, I think there have been a couple of iterations, but this one, which is the more, uh, I think the most next most recent one, is that accurate, Joe? This is the 96 um, right. plan. There was another one after this that had 17 lots. How many were on that one? 14 on this one. This one has 14. Oh, it was 14 <clears throat> initially. And it went to 17, and now it's 19. Right. Be, be aware, though, that the the open in between this this was submitted, I believe, under the cluster ordinance. Is that accurate? Yes. There is a difference. Please understand the distinction. Cluster subdivision. There was not a maximum size lot. There was a minimum size lot, but there was not a maximum size lot. So you could have bigger lots under the cluster subdivision, which this shows. These go up to 19,000 square foot lots, right? And the residual land, 40% max, uh, I think it, yeah, 40% would be open space, which is what this plan uh, identified. The road 
here is only 700 feet. This road up here is approximately 2,000 feet. So we have a longer road in this subdivision with more houses, but they're also smaller lots. So it's hard to compare the two. If I had my preference, I would go with the cluster subdivision, shorter road, and bigger lots. This one also, I'm stealing the stun here. This one also had some um, characteristics which would have been appealing to South Portland. Along the back side here, we had a 15-foot um, easement. You can do things like that when you have larger lots. This new subdivision, the lot is only 90 feet deep, and it's hard to give 10 feet, 15 feet away on, that, on the property. So this one certainly was a much more attractive subdivision. But as was pointed out earlier, the ordinance changed. And in changing, they recognized the smaller lots and the restrictions a smaller lot um, offers to a, build, a developer or a builder. And that's why the ordinance also states very, very clearly that under, under zone um, RA or RC, that at the discretion of the planning board, they can alter the side and rear setbacks. They can make some, some changes to the plans. And that's what we're asking you to do, is give them permission to act on, on their information, act on their um, expertise. Yet we're not... I'm sorry, you're speaking from a place yeah. where you are not being picked up by the record. No, Nobody okay. knows what you're saying on, on television. Okay, but that's um, if, if, if you want to speak, we'll certainly give you an opportunity to approach the, uh, the microphone. Yeah, I'm going in the direction that he was responding to anyway. So. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> what we're asking for is, is the, the side and rear setbacks based on the information presented. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, Kat? well, let me ask a couple of follow-ups, if I may, please. Okay. Um, do you know, can you tell me what the total area of the buildable lots were in the original plan versus the current plan? You know that if you don't. The total area that was yeah. buildable at that time? Yeah. I mean, the lots were bigger, but there were fewer. So it was well, about the same are, are we Are we including the common area at that time also? No, just the buildable lots, the buildable lots that were being built on. Well, I just added up the um, the footage, and it looked like it was 500 by 500. So that would be approximately f uh, five acres, five acres at the time. So it's, it's well over 200,000 square feet, you're saying? versus the 168,000 square feet you have now? There's no question that, that this is, um, I mean, with the bigger lots, you might have more developed land. We're what, well, what I'm, okay, what I'm trying to get at is because the, cur the current plan has more lots, but if your number that you just gave me is correct, you're actually preserving more open space. Is that true? Or? I believe in the old plan, and we're going back five years plus countless meetings, uh, I think that there were, well, 40 percent of the land was open space. We're now at 59 percent of the land being used as open space. Okay. Yeah, that's the same calculation I reached by the uh, density calculations yeah. versus the open space yeah. requirement, 40 percent. Yeah. And just just to take it one step further, since you're asking these questions, the maximum lot size is 9,000 square feet. We're at uh, 80. The average. The, the, average. the maximum average size is 9,000 9, square feet. We're at 88 
8,869. So we're, we're close. I mean, it's, it's, that's the average know, lot size. That's the average lot size cannot exceed nine. Yeah, the total. Under the so you can have some 12,000 square feet. The others, you, may, you might have to have two at 7,500, the minimum. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, one, uh, one more follow-up question. Um, the space that's being left as undeveloped space, yeah, how much of that is actually buildable space? Well, as Richard Manthon was, was saying in the background, this, we could get 25 lots on this plan, on this plan right here. We could get 25. We have the 19. So there's six more. We could get six more lots, which would be another. So 5,400 square feet, roughly. Yeah. 54,000 yeah. square feet. That's through all the formulas of taking the buildable land and backing out this and that and you know, still reserving, uh, still reserving the minimum for open space. Is that 23 lots? 25 lots, 25 max. Lots. Okay. We worked this plan. We had several other road configurations. Um, we discussed this with the public works director, the planning director, the town engineer. They have looked at this plan, reviewed the plan, and basically feel that this is best in keeping with the, the spirit of the ordinance and what the ordinance was trying to develop and trying to preserve. Um, one other question in a little bit different direction. What's the minimum setback of any lot, any house has on any of these lots right now? The minimum setback? Minimum setback. 20. It's 20 and 20. 20 okay. Allow me to point out two things. If you refer to the... Oh, I'm sorry. Would you ask that question again, please? What is the setback? The minimum setback any house has on any of the lots that's currently laid out here. In the subdivision or, or the abutting properties? No, in your, in your proposed subdivision. Yeah, it, that's, it's 20 feet. It's 20 feet front, side, rear. On abutting property owners, on the South Portland side, it's, it's six feet. In fact, I believe they're in the um, South Portland Planning Board this evening requesting building envelopes to be established to be six foot side and rear setbacks. So what they're asking for is greater than what I'm asking for. I'm sorry. The six feet has nothing to do with what's happening in Cape Elizabeth. Well, it may. It may. And I say that because one of the arguments is, can the applicant do what his neighbors, the, the 10 average neighbors, no, can do? Never mind. I'm not, okay. I'm not talking about any building in South Portland. I'm talking about well, I'm talking about what's it's happening but here in Cape Elizabeth. Okay. So the, the, the houses that you propose to build, no house will be closer than 20 foot to any property line, is that correct? No, I'm asking for a variance to go no closer than 15 feet. I'm asking for a five foot variance. Currently, it's 20 feet. Yeah, that's, that's what I was trying to get at. Okay, so I'm asking for a five foot variance right. to make it no more than 15 okay. feet side, 15 foot. S uh, rear, and the other side. Okay. The that's, front that's will stay the same. You. Okay. Yeah. Now you're asking for a five foot variance on lots one through 19. That's correct. A, f a five foot variance to allow me a 15 foot setback. setback. I'm not asking for a five foot setback. So 15 foot was the answer to the question I asked. Okay. okay. All right. Well, Joe, I was confused by your answer also on Sorry. that question when you said it was 20 feet. As drawn on your proposed plan, is there a 15 or a 20 foot setback rear and side? I believe right now it is a, it's a 20 foot. All right. We are asking for the five foot. So does it work with 20 feet? It would work, but it wouldn't allow us to do what other people can do on the surrounding properties. 
on all the surrounding properties, and I'm talking a house with an attached two-car garage with maybe a breezeway, or even a, a basic house with a two-car garage. The maximum width is 50 feet, and that's kind of a very restrictive house. You either have a big house and a small garage, or a big garage and a small house. We're asking for that extra five feet on either side to give us a 60-foot building envelope width. All right. Now, I'm not the first one that's asked for this. Um, there is a, um, a recent subdivision, a whaleback subdivision on Old Ocean House Road. And he was granted side and rear setbacks, two down as, as low as, as five feet. So it, I'm not setting a precedent with this request. The planning board recognized the advantages of um, open space zoning, and they allowed them to basically expand the building envelope or reduce the side setbacks. The other, the other point that I wanted to make is... I, that's a different situation than this, though, quite different as far as I know. It's a much, much larger piece of land and fewer houses, isn't it? But they're in an A zone. They're in an A zone. And the A zone and the C zone, at the board's discretion, can reduce the setbacks. So it's a similar situation in, in as much as they had them reduced. But when you say you're not asking for anything more than what already exists, you're talking, you're comparing it to South Portland, not to Cape Elizabeth, aren't you? Well, I'm saying that my setbacks are going to be greater than the abutters to this, to this the property. In South Portland. Yes, right. they happen to be in South Portland, right. um, but they also are abutters, all right, and their setbacks are six feet. The other thing is, in the ordinance, when we have a non-conforming lot, which is less than 20,000 square feet, there is a provision in the ordinance to grant, without, without going to the zoning board, there is a provision in the ordinance to allow a reduction down to 10 feet side and rear setbacks. So on, on a number of lots, even the one we just, uh, we just talked about uh, last hour, uh, the side and rear setbacks can be reduced down to 10 feet. So the provision, there is a provision in the ordinance standing provision that precludes the applicant for a building permit to come to us, excuse me, to you people, the zoning board, to ask for a variance. And he can get it reduced down to 10 feet. Um, well, the way I read the practical difficulty standard, we're not authorized to grant anything less than a 15, is it, is it 10 or 15 foot? Bruce, on the practical difficulty standard, is it, can we go down 10 feet? You can go down to 10. Feet. That's the minimum we can. We're right. authorized to go. Down. Okay. I'm only asking for five feet, down to 15 feet. Five feet so down to 15. Feet. Down to. I'm not asking to go down 10 feet to 10 right. feet. I'm just asking from five to 15 feet side sure. setbacks. How large will these houses be? I know you just said that, but. That? Depending on the buyer, depending on the size of his pocketbook and how we made out in the stock market. Are we talking like 3,000 square feet or 2,000? No, no. We're looking at, at between 1,500 and probably 2,200 square feet. Okay. Again, the building envelope is very restrictive, so it's, they're not going to be monstrous houses. Okay. The, there is a provision in the zoning ordinance that... Um, mandates that a minimum of two houses be built under $225,000. And I'm sure a lot of you have experienced construction costs in the recent, uh, recent past, so you know how much you can buy for $225,000. It's not a huge house, three bedroom house, bath and a half, maybe two and a half baths in a small 20 by 20 garage. Let me ask one question again, Joe. Someone else may have this. I heard this from someone else. Uh, the zoning variance, zoning variance lives for one year and be renewed for another year. Do you plan to complete this subdivision within a two-year period? Well, I plan 
to be started in one year. I started in 1994. Well, I mean, it has right. substantially completed, I believe, is the wording. Yeah. Uh, Within one year of the... We'll have to cross that bridge when we get to it. I, it's my intention to uh, forge ahead with this once I get the approvals or disapprovals this evening. Um, I think we have a, an application pending before the... Um, that's been submitted to the planning board. And as soon as we can get on the calendar, on their agenda, we're going forward well, with our plans. Let me ask you, is it feasible to, be, to consider that this will be substantially completed in well, 12 months? Jack, let me, let me answer this by saying, I remember when St. Bartholomew's came before us mm -hmm. for a variance. And I remember when St. Albans came before the, the zoning board and asked for a variance. And it was well beyond a year's time before they actually get started. So I think there may be some mechanism in which they can ask for a renewal or it is renewed. I think a 12 month renewal. I'm, I'm not sure whether, I know a variance is 12 months, but I can't remember uh, either one of those uh, organizations coming back before the board to ask for a, um, an extension. However, if it's necessary, we'll come back before the board and ask for an extension. I believe one 12 month renewal is permission. Is that correct? That's correct. So I, that's why the question, I, the way I phrased it was. It's a difficult situation for someone to come before. We don't know what's going to be before us. Right. And I'm sure that if it gets to the point where it's getting close, we'll have to come back and see what we can do. Well, I think the way it stands, you'd have to complete it within two years. Now, what's, that was my question to you, whether it's feasible. Um, that it could be completed within two years. Yes, it could be. But whether it is or isn't really doesn't answer the questions that we have to address tonight right. <clears throat> with regard to your variance. If it can't be and you're at risk for some reason as a result, that's correct. That's your risk. Do you have any potential buyers that are supportive of this? Who are here to speak? They all are. Who are here to speak? Uh, no, I don't have any potential buyers here. Um, I cannot advertise the properties. Uh, I cannot take reservations. I mean, there's nothing I can do uh, with a buyer. You know, we could have stacked this, this place tonight with supportive people. Uh, I didn't think that was in the best interest of, of uh, the board and, and in the, uh, we're here on our own. Um, there have been a number of people that have called me on the subdivision and uh, are very excited about what's being planned and are very hopeful that this goes through. This is providing, uh, in Cape Elizabeth terms, affordable housing. This is providing someone an opportunity to either move up from a three-bedroom ranch that cannot be expanded or down from a big six-bedroom uh, six house with three or four bathrooms uh, that uh, is too big for the family now. Any other questions? Dr. Chapman. On your preliminary plan dated August 7th, just for clarification, within each buildable lot is a uniformly hatched line. Yeah. The legend does not indicate that, but I assume that's the outline of the building envelope. Is that correct? That's correct. Taking lot number 17 as an example, could you describe the front left, right, and rear setbacks, please, for me. Can you, in footage, what, what is indicated by the building envelope in footage uh, on taking lot number 17 as an example? Actually, the front and sides look like 20 feet. The rear setback is not 20 feet. It looks... Wrong ten. Plan. That's ten. That's ten? Yeah. Oh. Well this is August seventh. What should it be twenty? It should be twenty, but it appears to be ten. I'm sorry? It should be twenty, but it appears to be ten uh, it appears to be ten. It should be twenty feet. According to your then based on your graphic scale, the indicated 
left setback is 20 feet. That's correct. The indicated right setback is 20 feet. That's correct. The indicated front or road frontage setback is what? 20 feet. And the indicated or depicted rear setback is what? It shows 10 feet. Why? Uh, because this is the plan that I got. There's several plans. Unfortunately, I submitted the wrong one to you. Um, we were talking about, and, I'm, and I say we, I'm talking with the planning director, my engineer. We were talking about different setbacks. Prior to Maureen O'Mara telling me that we needed to come before the zoning board for a variance, prior before Maureen O'Mara telling me that the Perkins Amendment was dictating that I come to this board, we were talking a 10-foot rear setback. That is why this plan was made. Since then, we have rethought what we're doing. It was changed to 20-foot, a 20-foot rear setback, with the um, with the idea that I would come before the zoning board and ask for a five-foot rear setback. Say that again. <laughs> I don't know whether I can. We were told, after we prepared this and submitted this to the workshop with a 10-foot setback, we were told that if we wanted to do the 10-foot setback, we would have to come to the zoning board for a rear and side setback reduction, get a variance. All right, we were told this after we had our workshop session. So we... You were told at the workshop? No, no, we were told afterwards. We were told afterwards. I don't even think the planning board knows that I'm here tonight. I don't think that they know about the Perkins Amendment. All right. The town planner knows, and the town planner directed me to come, come here. This was after the workshop session, which was held in August 7th. All right. This was prepared for the August 7th meeting with the 10-foot setback. But after we prepared it, after we submitted it, after we discussed it, we had time to talk with a number of people the town attorney, the town engineer, uh, the, ta uh, the, um, the public works director. And it came out in conversation after August 7th that anything other than 20 feet, you have to come to the zoning board for a reduction. And that's why I'm here now. So this plan was submitted to the planning board. This is the one that was submitted. This is the one that I prepared for this board based on um, information based on the preparations that we went through. So this was submitted. Actually, it's incorrect. I apologize. We're asking not for a 10-foot uh, rear setback, but a 15-foot rear setback. Which is a variance of five feet. Which is a variance of, of five feet. When you changed the plans, did you shift the whole envelope forward? To the no, you, no, you can't do that. You can just move that real line or the side lines. Basically, the envelope now is 20 feet on either on all sides. That's correct. If I look at the lot adjacent to the one that Dr. Chapman asked about, lot 16, it looks like there is a, an outline of a potential house there anywhere that's 48 foot by 34 foot, um, and it's probably about a 35 feet, 40 feet away from the back. So uh, my question is, do you really need to have a five-foot variance for every lot? That, that house does not have a, a rear deck. It what? does not have a rear deck. So if someone were to have sliding doors, okay. they would need space to put a deck. Well, I mean, even... Now, keep in mind that that is a... Looks like there's still a room for a big rear deck. Right. It's a 90-foot lot. 20 foot is the front setback, so it gives you 70 feet. If you had 20 foot rear setback, that would give you 50 foot. Right? Right. Then you would have a 30 foot house, 34 foot house 60 but it's only 42 foot wide. All right? 48 foot. 48 foot? 
pretty okay. good size house. Yes, but there's no garage to that house. So in most cases, you stagger the garage forward with a room behind the garage. So now the house is probably 48 feet, 24 foot garage plus, plus a functional room um, behind it. And then if you wanted to put a deck, that's why you need the, the added space in the back. That house would not accommodate a, a two car garage and still have a functional living room if they were to be side by side. And that's the point that I made, that the abutting properties have attached garages, maybe a breezeway, and then a decent sized house. So the five foot variance requesting from the back property line is, is for decks? Could be for decks, yes. Okay. Side said, we say it will be for decks? It will be for decks. It will be for decks. I, the house won't go back that far, no way. Okay. No way. I mean, you just, we will probably keep the properties close to the front, 20 foot. Uh, front setback and build a house maybe 25 maximum and build a house and go back and then the deck would be on that certainly the last 15 feet 14 feet but this is to accommodate and, that, and the reason we need the, the side setback is to spread the house out a bit so you can probably co accommodate a two-car garage and a 28-foot wide house these all, single, these all ranch style houses it depends. I've had some people ask me for ranches. I've had some that want the two-story houses. We're talking the empty nesters. They're looking for all on one level. And obviously, you need a bigger building envelope for, for those people. The younger growing families, they want to go up and down. Now, well, let me ask you to look go ahead. where I was going. I think you understood where I was going with that. Um, as far as the back property line, the back bearing, five foot variance with the back setback, the rear setback, uh, if we were to put a condition on that, that that's only for a deck, not for an enclosed part of the structure, that's acceptable to you then? Yes, that's acceptable to me. I wouldn't build a house that close to the property line, especially with, with the, the closeness of, of the of the other structures on the Gowdy Street properties. Uh, we try to maximize as much as we can, but it is, it is to accommodate a deck or, or to vary, vary the architectural design of the houses, stagger the garage forward so they could have a, have a, uh, a family room behind the garage. Joe, just so I understand that exchange that you just Head with Mr. Keneally, um, you're willing to accept a condition that only a deck would extend closer than 20 feet to the rear property line. Yeah, I, I, I would go, I would go with that. I don't think I need to say an accessory dwelling, uh, accessory uh, building, um, but I think probably I. If we could, um, say the main, main portion of the building would not exceed 20 feet, and that would give us latitude to have a tool shed in the back of a house or something. Um, is, um, what about a deck. detached two-car garage? I don't think there'd be a two detached building uh, garage in this subdivision. I don't think you have space to do it. Is there any reason why you show different rear setbacks on some lots and not on others? For example, one, two, three, eight, and nine do not show a reduced setback, rear setback, and it seems like the balance of others do show some reduced setback. Is there, is there some indication as to why those some were selected and some were not. And yes, you yes. Have similar lot sizes. Uh, some are, for example, uh, lot one shows a uniform lot size uh, uh, setback with a lot size of 7581, and so does number two with a uh, 8,000 feet. Uh, 
and some similar size lots show a reduced setback. What is the logic behind that? Well, in lots one and two, there's wetlands there, RP1, and you cannot disturb, excuse me, an RP2 wetland. I'm sorry. Sir. One and two, you have wetlands. Okay. So we cannot disturb the wetlands, and that's why it stops at 20 feet. Okay. Lot nine, uh, it looks as though there's no rear setback. It's all sides. Um, and what's the other question? Was there another one? Hey. I think eight might be the same as nine. There's no, there's not a determined rear yard on that. It fronts on Fernwood Lane and that other strip. Pursuant to that question then, <clears throat> You can design uh, the plan to accommodate the houses of your choice without a reduction in setback on some lots and not on others. What is your reason for not abiding by the uh, setback throughout and not reducing in some lots? Well, again, you have different price homes and you have to have affordable two houses that have to be affordable houses. And there's some limitations that this, the town has established. And one of them is the size of the house. So some of these lots are designated for affordable houses. Do you designate that in advance? Yes. Which lots? I mean, the... the that will be done through the planning process. And the number, what is that total number in this sub proposed subdivision? It's two. However, if you designate more than you would get the density bonus. You get what? But right, density bonus. I don't want to confuse you on those. That it's two right now. For these 19 units, it's two. It's two, that's correct. Have you designated those two? At the no, I have not. Or lot number? I have not designated them. Would the five foot reduction in setback be specific lot to lot, or is that blanket for the whole subdivision? Maybe I should ask Bruce this question. He's asked for all the lots to be reduced. Say again? He's asked for all, all the lots to be close to the five feet close. Can that be? parsed out among the lots? Or is it a blanket reduction is what my question is? Is it? Well, it's what he's asked for. I, I guess the board could. I understand that. But can it be designated on a lot by lot basis if necessary? I would, I would think so. I'm wondering if you're overstepping your bounds in doing so. Um, it, it almost appears as though this is a planning board issue and you're, I mean, if they change the lot sizes, if they change a few things, I'm wondering if I have to come back to you and get the okay again if we do something like that. What I was asking to do is, is have the overall picture reduced. I guess I'm give, asking. Well, excuse me, let me finish. To give the planning board the prerogative. We're not, you're not, this isn't carte blanche. You're not saying, all right, this is going to happen. You're saying you can do it if you want. That's what you're telling the planning board. If you want to attach a rider to that, saying that you have serious concerns about such and such a lot, you know, I don't mind that. But what I'm asking for is the approvals, excuse me, to give the planning board the prerogative to expand the building envelopes. You're not doing that tonight. The planning board still has to look at this and weigh the merits of this proposal 
And if they want to reduce them, they will. I don't think that should preclude us doing what we think is reasonable. Though, either. Uh, I'm sorry? I don't think the fact that this may be an iterative process should preclude us from doing something that we may feel is reasonable at this point. Well, if you want to, if you, want to you know, specify that you think that uh, redu reduction on such and such a lot isn't in the best interest of the zoning board, I guess that's your prerogative. But I, I'm, I'm asking, I'm asking you for the variance to allow the planning board to use their discretion, which is what's spelled out in the in the ordinance. We're not going by a lot by lot subdivision. This is a little unique because this hasn't been approved. This has not been approved yet. So I, I can't come back after they approve it and say, can I ask for the setback? I mean, the building envelopes have been established. And it's, you know, call it a catch-22 if you want. But I think what, you're, what I'm asking you to do is rely upon the integrity of the planning board. Well, we're all treading on new ground here. Um, and, and it's this landmark case that we're trying to use that's guiding us in terms of how we how we deal with it to some extent. Um, so we are taking on a function that previously was thought to be a planning board function, and we're having to do it um, underneath the zoning board structure. So you talk about granting a set of conditions for a whole development. Well, as a zoning board, we don't normally do that. We deal with things on a lot-by-lot -lot basis, and so I think my own feeling is that would be the best way for us to do this because that's the way we do things. I think there's one thing to keep in mind that these lots are proposed so that those lot, any of those lines that divide each individual lot is right. not set in concrete. So it would probably be hard for the board to take a look at individual lots and, and have different setbacks. Um, that said, it probably ought to be a blanket denial or approval based on a setback to 15 feet for that entire property line um, because it, it, it is subject to change as far as lot configuration at the planning board level. At what point in time do these lot lines become cast in concrete? The day it's approved by the planning board. That's what's unique about this. We, we're, we're dealing with a variance to lots that propose lots. I mean, that's what you're right, Jack. You're treading, treading new ground. New ground. Yeah. Bruce, we don't really need to worry at all about the building envelope because that's the planning board's determination whether they're going to change the setbacks from the building well, envelope. Well, uh, the building envelope will be established based on 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 whether the applicant is successful at this level with a variance. Okay, so the building envelope in, in existence, in relation to the existing streets, isn't something we need to deal with. Well, that is actually who's, who's building envelope? exactly what we're dealing with. Um, right now, the building envelope, um, without any action by us, permits Joe to build a house that is no closer to 20 feet to the property line on any side. I mean, right. He's asking us to He's asking for permission to be able to expand the size of the building envelope. No, um, I, I appreciate that. I'm thinking the, the I'm looking at the, what is it, 197C6, uh, where it talks about the building envelope shall be at least 75 feet from the roadway. We're, he hasn't asked us to change that, so I'm assuming that that's something. That's the next topic. He, he hasn't yet, but he will before the night's over. Okay. So, no, we're not Correct? dealing with that this in no. this. See, it's interpretation of the town, and it has been for years, that, that building envelopes are, are only those, those areas of a lot that's established through a planning board approval, that setbacks established through the ordinance, um, and that envelopes established on subdivision plan. Okay. We're just so a, a setback to a, a property that's, that didn't have a building envelope established is simply setback. Right. No, I appreciate that. That's okay. Well, we've been going now for an hour and 45 minutes. I'd like to take about a 10-minute break. Um, 
and let's keep it to uh, 10 minutes. We'll resume at 8.58. Did anybody have anybody um, on the board have additional questions for Mr. Bristasi? Um, I have a question for uh, Mr. Hedo, um, and I'll let you defer to your client if you would like to um, on this. I'll do my best uh, but since you had made the arguments initially, I'd like to um, ask you to go back over sure. uh, one of the items. And that was when you were going through the various elements of the practical difficulty standard. Yes. Uh, one of those elements, of course, is that there's no other feasible alternative, no other feasible alternative to a variance that is available uh, to the petitioner. And the question that is coming to mind as I hear this is, is it feasible to avoid the need for a variance by simply having a couple fewer lots? Uh, and well, redesign the development just a bit to do this with I, 17 lots or 16 lots. I, I think the question of feasibility is exactly what, th that's the issue that that, that that raises, whether the development of this subdivision with two fewer lots is feasible in the sense of practical financially feasible and those issues. And I will have to defer to Mr. Prestacci to some extent on that, but I will point out that it's not a matter of taking two lots out and making the rest of the lots larger because he can't do that. It would increase the average lot size to something in excess of what the open spaces ordinance permits. So it would really mean simply eliminating two lots from the subdivision entirely and leaving the rest at the size at the size at which they're currently planned. And even that would have to be done pretty selectively. They'd have to take lots at or greater than 9,000 square feet out so as not to let the average, again, if, it, if they took out two lots that were under 9,000 square feet, it would knock the average up again. Well, so, if the average exceeded 9,000 square feet, you could no longer uh, develop under the open space uh, section of the ordinance, but correct. could you develop under another section of the ordinance? I, I think on that one I'll have to defer to uh, Mr. Manthorne and Mr. Fristacci in terms of how feasible that is because I think the answer is, I mean, certainly uh, up to a certain number of lots you could put lots there and put houses on them. The question I think really becomes whether it's a practical alternative and, and in terms of whether it is I think I can't speak to that but if you will permit me I think perhaps the people better able to speak to that are the others here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dick Manthon. I'm a professional engineer, land surveyor, and site evaluator. I've designed this project, uh, I think, seven times now. If we go by the regular zoning, it would be a minimum of 15,000 square foot per lot. What we're attempting to do here is to leave a large open space available to the public of Cape Elizabeth and I guess other towns. Um, my intention was that there is an existing open space that was set up when Rosewood 1 was approved. And my intention was to try to increase the size of that open space for wildlife and just having natural land available to the public. Uh, if we increase the lots to 15,000 square foot, it means that I will eat up a good portion of that open space. And um, as a person who has done this for a long time, I really like this design of the smaller lots and leaving large open space available. 
but whether you like it, like the design or not, isn't the standard that we have to go by. Well, you have the two standards. You can go by the more than 15,000 square foot lots, or you can go by the open space requirement of an average of maximum average of 9,000 square foot lots and a minimum size of each one of those lots of 7,500, thereby leaving a large space available uh, that is not disturbed. So if, if, so if you built without open space zoning, you would be required to have lots with a minimum square footage of 15,000 feet, correct? Yes, 15,000 square feet. And did you attempt to do a I, design with Yes, I've done, I did a couple sizes? plans. I call them sketch plans. They're rough plans that I did for Mr. Fastashi. Um, originally, you have to understand that we were coming in from South Portland in a U-shaped road that would um, enter onto the Charlotte Road and Edgewood Road, and so I had to configure the lots around that. And then eventually they eliminated the entrance of Charlotte Road, so then I had to come in from Edgewood with a cul-de-sac off of that. And at that time, I believe those lots were all around 15,000 square feet. It's it's been a while, it's hard to remember. Well, have you tried to I configure the lots with a minimum of 15,000 square feet with access from Mitchell Road? I have not. I think, and I, I need the interpretation from the code enforcement officer, I think we're talking 20,000 square foot. Uh, it's not 15,000, it, the minimum lot size is 20,000 square feet. That's correct. I did some sketch, sketch plans. Uh, keep in mind that I've been working on this since 1994, and I've been working very closely with Maureen O'Mara, the town planner. Maureen kind of gives you direction as to what the town and what the planning board is looking for. What they're looking to do is maximize the open space in this neighborhood. You have the pond, and you have this wetland area in here. It's my understanding that you can go from South Portland all the way to Scarborough on the Green Belt. This is the final piece, according to Maureen, to tie everything in, to maximize a continuous open space area. I'm sorry, Bruce. So when we designed open space, when we designed the subdivision with 20,000 square foot lots, there are other formulas that kick in. You have to contribute money if you do not have open space, if you do not have the mandatory uh, affordable housing. You have to kick in some, some formula, some cash, so that they can buy open space elsewhere. In doing so, you're not preserving open space. You're destroying the um, environmental aspects of this land, tall pines, the ledge outcropping, the wetlands, etc. You also have to have a road system that's probably going to be the same as what you're seeing on the plan. That road system can go between $200 and $300 a lineal foot. So to develop the road with water and sewer and sidewalks and all in an RC zone, you're going to have half the lots or maybe even a third of the lots. So economically, it's not feasible. You need the numbers to make it work. All right. I recently purchased um, 138 Mitchell Road to gain access to this land, which increased the cost. That road system is approximately 300 feet before you get to the land which you can develop. If you go to the 20,000 square foot lot, you're looking at approximately 19, 18, and 17 for one lot. Half of 17 become one lot. Long road frontage, you're not benefiting by having a greater building envelope or the depth of the building envelope. So in effect, you're defeating the purpose of the open space ordinance. 
Cape Elizabeth feels very, very strongly about this open space uh, ordinance, very strongly. They have the support of all the, the conservation commissions, land uh, trusts. They want this. That's why it's in the ordinance. That's why they gave the incentives to the developer to go this route. It was considered, but it was not feasible, Dave, to do the regular subdivision. It was not feasible. There was a time before I purchased 138 Mitchell Road to extend Rosewood Drive down and have, and have a, a looping road. We worked the numbers. We talked with Maureen. We were discouraged. So we didn't pursue it. It's not feasible to do it any other way. And that's why I do it. That's why Joel Fitzpatrick did it on two subdivisions in Cape Elizabeth. That's why they did it out to um, Cross Hill. That is a cluster subdivision. The benefits that the town get outweigh any inconveniences that, that might be presented. It's not feasible. Joe, would you address one other issue Julie. for me? Julie. As long as you're up there, and if you want okay. to defer back to your council to answer it, that's fine. Another element under the practical difficulty standard is the significant economic injury, which is part of the definition of practical difficulty. Um, and significant economic injury is defined as placing the applicant for a variance at a disadvantage in the neighborhood by applying zoning ordinance standards, which would prevent the applicant from having a structure or accessory structure comparable in size, location, and number to those of other lot owners in the immediate neighborhood, but in no case fewer than 10 of the nearest property owners. Um, and although Mr. Haddo had addressed that briefly, I'd like that fleshed out a little bit more. Um, okay, I'll, I'll address it and then I'll let him reiterate. 2B, 2, uh, 2B, significant economic injury. Although this is a, a open space zoning reduced lots, we recognize that. And what we're limited to are small, narrow homes. This is not what's in the neighborhood. If you took a tour of the neighborhood, you would see what I'm talking about. Every house, whether it be a Cape, Colonial, Garrison, you have a Cape, Colonial, or Garrison with an attached garage next to it. Some have breezeways separating the garage and the house. Those houses are much greater than 50 feet long. I cannot do that right now. I cannot do it under the current standards. And, it, and the ordinance recognizes that. Is the and that, description that you're giving us um, an accurate description of the homes that border your proposed subdivision? I submitted in the application a uh, survey prepared by uh, Titcom Associates back in 1994. And if you look at the footprint of the abutting properties all around, you can get a visual as to what is in the, in the neighborhood. Granted, this was done in 1994. Some of the houses have changed. But that's what the houses have. I can't do what all of those properties have done. I cannot build those houses on these lots. And that's why we're asking for, it's only a five foot setback on either side. That gives us a 60 foot wide house. I'm comfortable with that. Keep in mind the ordinance allows me to ask for in this particular case, an 80-foot wide house. I'm not asking for that. I'm just asking for the 60-foot wide house. And that is in keeping with uh, most of the houses on the um, uh, abutting properties. So that's, that's how I address the significant injury. I'm limited by the, by the ordinance, by the standards right now, in as much as I cannot duplicate what's on the houses around me. And we're not going to the homes on Rosewood Drive. We're not using those. 
That's a separate subdivision known as Rosewood. We're doing Blueberry Ridge, and I'm talking the properties along here. Now, okay. thank you. If you want uh, Mr. Haddow to. Uh, no, I think you've okay. given me a complete answer. Thank you. Mr. Fustashi, staying with this diagram that you pointed out earlier, you have setbacks denoted for the, for the adjacent properties. Yes. yes, I do. In some cases, 15, 10 feet. Um, in one, it looks like it's a utility shed at three feet. How genuine are those numbers? On lot 1186, and that's map 1186 of South Portland's uh, assess assessor's map, in 1188 you'll see a, a diamond on the boundary line. Um, I noticed that's, that has been moved in the last week or so, so that is now not there. The rest of them, uh, within a foot or two, they're very accurate. The surveyor, uh, as you can see, the, the numbers is very precise, very accurate. Going back to the other map, which is still up on the bulletin board, and comparing it to the earlier map, it, it seems of the 16 acres, you're continuously working with that same upper right-hand corner. Of the 16 of the acres, that is the best, use, best lots that you can utilize. Is that correct? Yes, it is, um, for a variety of reasons. In the past, when we had this plan, water and sewer were, act, were available to us over here. The land that's been designated for open space is all ledge here, or it's ledge outcropping, and you have wetlands here. To access this portion of it right, would again go against what the town is trying to accomplish, and that is contiguous open space all the way beyond. All right? To place a house here, and we had one planned. I think you can see we had a house planned right here, and that's been deleted at the suggestion of the town planner. This is the good land. This is where the soils are good. Yes, there is a little ledge here, um, but this is where all the good land is, right along here. As I said, I recently purchased 138 Mitchell Road, and now I can access this land here. There's no ledge. It seems to have good soils. Um, it gradually slopes down here. So yes, we are continuing to use this land because this is a land that's, that's suitable for developing. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Prestasi? Dr. Chapness. Regarding C6, where it states that the sideline setbacks must be at least 50 feet. Uh, on the letter dated August 11, 2000 from the town attorney Michael Hill to Maureen Amira, he states that the board does have the authority to modify and reduce the side setbacks. Uh, if the uh, reduction does not violate the setbacks in the underlying zone, which is RC in this case, and uses the example of reducing them from 25 to 20, which in turn would reduce the stated building envelope side setbacks from 50, as shown in C6, to 40. Now, it's my understanding that on your application, 
you are requesting five feet setbacks on both sides to further reduce that which in the worst case or the closest case scenario would put the two building envelopes 30 feet from each other, 15, 15 for 30. In view of that, what has been your findings in regards to reducing C6 from the stated 50 to the 40 as uh, the minimum for the underlying district setbacks, RC, and five feet further reduction in those put, would put the closest building envelopes. I'm referring in this discussion only from your building envelope to your building envelope. I'm not talking about existing structures, but would, could put those as close as 30 feet to each other. What has been your uh, findings regarding that? Where Mike Hill is addressing the fact that in, in that letter that we can reduce them down to 20 feet. That's prevailing site setbacks. Whether there's a building envelope or not, the planning board can do that. Once they go beyond the 20 foot, whether there's a building envelope or no building envelope, they have to come before, I have to come before this board. So I can, right now, I can go 40 feet between building envelopes or between buildings. Right. But under your request, for example, taking lots, doesn't matter, lots one and two, if you had a five foot side reduction on one and a five foot side reduction on lot two, would that not put the two building envelopes 30 feet from each other? That's correct. That is correct. That is correct. Okay. If, if. And how is that viewed in, in regards to C6, where it states that the, the mill, uh, and at least 50 feet from any building envelope on an adjacent lot? The letter states that the planning board has that prerogative, that they can reduce them down, that, that you're talking C6. Page 128, okay, C6. Okay, at least 50 feet. All right. It states very clearly that the provisions in this section shall be optional, and this is under 1972A2. So they have the option to reduce it down to... 40 feet, so that 50 feet can be reduced down to 20 and 20. Okay, it can be reduced down to the but 40. Your requested variance, it could be 30 feet, 15, 15. That's correct. That's correct. That's that's what I'm asking. I'm asking to reduce it down so that we're down to 30 foot. Well. Which that's an existing, that's an existing. Back to the planning board issue and what I was getting at earlier. Yeah. How can we approve that when the planning board has not addressed that issue, apparently, down to 30 feet? You're giving them permission to address the, that issue. Say again? You're giving them permission to address that issue. That's what I'm asking for this evening, is for permission so the planning board can reduce these down, these side setbacks down at their discretion. Any other questions for Mr. Frustasi? Thank you. Um, is there any other evidence that you wish to present in support of your application? recognizing that we will also provide you with rebuttal time if that's necessary. Is there anybody else here in the room who wishes to speak in favor of the application? I assume that there are people here to speak against, in opposition to the application. Who would like to go first? Mr. Crawford. You've been very patient Thanks, in sir. awaiting your turn. I uh, apologize for taking off my suit jacket. I'm not used to this. Uh, 
don't apologize. It's uh, by necessity, we have to be somewhat informal. This is not a cool room to spend a lot of time in. Right, I appreciate it. Um, my name is Rob Crawford. I represent Yolan Fogg, uh, Tom and Marion Peterson, and David and Elizabeth Sawyer. And um, I'm here on their behalf to object to the uh, requested variances. I'll limit my comments as best I can on the particular application that's before you, but I think many of my comments will run over uh, to the second variance request that we may or may not get through this evening. As I understand it, Mr. Fastacci is proposing a reduction in the 20-foot setback that he believes is, is required or is allowed for his, his proposed um, lots, and that reduction would be applied to all lots. <clears throat> One of the uh, initial things that I would point out is that Mr. Fastacci on his own admission says that the 20-foot setback in essence works. And uh, I think that if you review that under the standards that we'll get into in detail a little bit further, that that clearly will not allow this board under the standards that are required to grant a variance for you to act uh, favorably on the request. <clears throat> While there are some laudable goals that Mr. Fasacci is, uh, is approaching and addressing in his project, and we uh, applaud him for that, housing for low to moderate income people, preservation of open space, I think you need to sit here tonight and also consider that there are other interests at stake, and those are the interests of the clients that I represent. Those people that, if this variance was allowed, would in essence have the views, the privacy, and the other issues that are part of the things that you need to look at uh, significantly impact. In other words, they'd have houses closer to them on, when they look out their back windows than your current ordinance would require and restrict from, from uh, houses within your community. <clears throat> the criteria that you folks need to look at, I think you're well aware of this for the uh, practical difficulty thing, is, is, is first there's the two questions that you, I think you need to address. And the first is that the granting of the variance would not resant, result in a substantial departure from the intent of the ordinance. As I view the ordinance, you have a unique provision in there that allows this type of open space project to proceed. And there's some different criteria in that than if this was a different type of subdivision or type of development. And the idea is that there's some trade-offs. If you're going to allow denser development, you need to have some trade-offs that make sure that denser development doesn't encroach on itself. In other words, that's why you have the open space, and that's why you have these buffer areas and other things that are of concern. But you also need to be concerned about whether you have dense development encroach on the neighbors. And those standards that were just referred to, I think, by Dr. Chatness there uh, to C6, I believe are there to make sure that when you have this type of more dense development that's allowed, that you make sure that there's an adequate buffering distance from that development to the neighboring properties that have not been the subject of the same types of deliberations and discussions as one needs to have addressed in the open space type of, of, of development. So I think when you look at this, and we'll talk about this in more detail, is that this request is in fact a substantial departure from the relevant standards that are required under the ordinance for this type of development. The second prong that needs to be addressed is the practical difficulty test. And as the board is well aware that that is statutorily defined in Title 30A under Section 4353. Practical difficulty means that the strict application of the ordinance to the property precludes the ability of the petitioner to pursue a use permitted in the zoning district in which the property is located and results in significant economic injury. And your ordinance defines significant economic injury. Precludes the ability of the petitioner to pursue a use permitted. It doesn't mean you get to have the maximum number of lots on a subdivision. It doesn't mean that you get to have an open space subdivision. The use that's allowed for this zone in the RC district that he's pursuing is single family dwellings. It doesn't mean you get to have as many as you might like. <clears throat> if you find that Mr. Fasacci has satisfied both of those elements, then you also need to go on to those other criteria that Mr. Haddo uh, briefly touched on. The granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not unreasonably detrimentally affect the appraised market value of abutting properties. In making such a determination, you need to look at whether or not there's blocking of an established view, whether or not there's a fire hazard, 
cast a shadow on the adjoining lot. Mr. Sawyer is here tonight, and he will demonstrate that if these houses are allowed to be in the proposed building envelopes, that there will be shadow impacts on the adjacent lots on Gowdy Street and Charlotte Street. Reduce the appraised value or eliminate the privacy of an adjoining property owner. There's no restrictions, there's no warranties, there's no representations pending by Mr. Prestazzi's application that I'm aware of that have made any accommodations of the privacy interest if he's allowed to go five feet closer to my client's houses in this thing. And I think when you look at those, there's a problem in terms of making that determination favorable that he has demonstrated and he has the burden to demonstrate that there's not an impact on the economic value of these adjoining houses. And I also would point out that that test is not a conjunctive test. It's not all of those criteria. It's or. Any of those criteria that you find that he has not met means that you can't grant him the variance. The practical difficulty is not the result of an action taken by the applicant. Mr. Fristacci is here putting together a plan. He's at the controls. He's at the helm. His decisions decide which way this subdivision can turn and which way it can come out. And I think that follows the Chair's comments. Couldn't you make some minor adjustments on this subdivision and not be here tonight seeking a 20-foot or a reduction of the 20-foot setback? <clears throat> Let me just start with that first, um, that reduction of the 25-foot setback. One of the things that's troubled me, and I think that Dr. Chatness pointed this out, is if you look at the section of the ordinance under which Mr. Fristacci is seeking authorization and then thereby seeking this variance from the planning board, it requires a 50-foot setback from all adjacent building envelopes. We're not talking about a 20-foot side or rear setback. Now, I realize there's some construction that's been gone in here and some interpretations on that, but I would submit to you for the record that truly what's being asked for here is a variance from a 50-foot setback from existing structures or existing building envelopes. Uh, we take difference with the way that the CAPE has interpreted the concept of a building envelope, but it just seems to me, practically speaking, one could go out there and measure on the face of the ground where the houses are located in adjacent and say, you know what, you can't have a building envelope any closer than 50 feet to those neighbors' homes. And that would satisfy the criteria. Granting an or a variance from that, to me, you need to you know, satisfy each of these criteria. Now, a reduction of only five feet, in fact, is a 25 percent reduction. Okay, a reduction from 20 feet to 15 feet is a 25 percent reduction in the side and setback variances. I submit to you that is significant on its face. I mentioned to you a moment ago that I think that the intent of this ordinance under the, on, under the open space provisions is to make sure that not only do we accommodate the way that these new proposed buildings and development works with, each, works with itself, because we have open space to offset dense or more dense development, we have buffers, we have other considerations there, but also those criteria, as pointed out by Dr. Chatmus and CSIC, are there to say, look, we need to make this harmonious to the existing structures and the existing neighborhoods that are in the vicinity of the proposed development. <clears throat> I think that Mr. Fastacci cannot demonstrate the strict application of the ordinance and rear side setback criteria precludes his ability to pursue a permitted use in the RC district. There's other options there. He's got 16 acres of land. The fact is that this is a laudable proposal, but my view on this is that if we shift this and say we draw those lines, which he's already indicated that he can live with, it's just not perhaps ideal, then we don't even have a need for a variance. Why not impose the requirement, the basic requirement, that your ordinance would afford to other, you know, development within your community? I think Mr. Fristacci has not satisfied the criteria that he needs to demonstrate that he can't have an alternative that works. <clears throat> now, significant economic injury, we had a, the definition of that is placing the applicant for a variance at a disadvantage in the neighborhood by requiring zoning ordinance standards which would prevent the applicant from having a structure or accessory structure comparable in size, location, and number to those other lots in the immediate neighborhood, but in no case fewer than 10 of the nearest property owners. And the ones we're talking about are here. Ms. Bumstead is here and she's done an analysis of what's going on on the ground out there and where the location of the primary structures are. And I suggest to you, I just looked at Mr. Fastacci's plan 
And I said, it's not appropriate to take a setback from an accessory structure. We need to look at the primary structures. Everybody knows accessory structures are there, and there's changes here and there, and there are little sheds that people have for bicycles and everything else. We need to focus on the distance from the Gowdy Street residence houses to the line that comes up on the Blueberry Ridge lot line, <clears throat> not the distance between the accessory structures and that, the primary structures. If you look at that, the average of the 13 houses that I found off of these plans, not taking the accessories, exceeds 20 feet. So Mr. Fastacci can't meet that criteria to say, hey, look, I need to go to 15 feet when you compare it to these, all, all these other properties that are at, at 20 or more feet. I don't think you can, you can grant the variance because he cannot show significant economic injury as defined under your ordinance. <clears throat> You know, there's another point that I wanted to point out to you. Article 1, page 17, definition of variance, right in your ordinance, your land use ordinance. It states that nor shall a variance be granted because of the presence of nonconformities in the zoning district or in the adjoining zoning district. I suggest you consider this because I think there's a message there. I haven't quite figured it out, but it seems to indicate that even if there are all these nonconformities surrounding it, you can't use that as your calculus to grant a variance. The other criteria I mentioned briefly, <clears throat> I think the reduction of the setbacks will have significant adverse imp economic impacts on the neighboring properties. There's going to be an impact from the shadows that encroach, which is one of the criteria. There's going to be an impact on the views. Elizabeth Sawyer's here tonight. The Petersons are here tonight. If you want to ask them what the views will be from their properties, they can tell you. And there's no accommodation or recognition of additional buffering. In fact, if you grant the five feet, I don't think you can impose as a condition buffering on there, but perhaps that's something you'd want to consider. <clears throat> Finally, I think the practical difficulty aspect of this escapes me. Um, Mr. Fastacci is at the driver's seat. He's the one who makes the call here. One of the provisions in your ordinance is that the practical difficulty can't be the person's own, they can't be of their own design. Here, that's clearly the case. As far as feasible alternatives, I would suggest to the board that the definition feasible legally means engineeringly possible. I'm not sure if that's what's intended in your ordinance, but that's a very high standard. <clears throat> and it's one that I don't think Mr. Fristacci has demonstrated that there is no, quote, feasible alternative for his use of this property. In conclusion, I would suggest that there's been a, a request for a substantial departure. The requests don't meet the practical difficulty test and the other criteria that are necessary for this board to authorize the requested variance. And I guess if that wasn't an enough, Mr. Fristacci on his own admission stated that he could live within the 20-foot setback criteria, and I would ask the board to deny the variance uh, from 20 feet to 15 feet based on that grounds alone and, and the uh, other points. I will make myself available uh, for questions or other interpretations. I know I gave you a lengthy letter. I tried to summarize the points that are in there. I apologize for the late arrival. I was kind of called to task at, uh, at the late moment here as well. I would turn the floor over now to Ms. Bumstead unless you have any immediate questions, questions of myself. Certainly, sir. Um, you, you're going through the setback of existing primary structures. and I'm having a little trouble hearing. You, you were going through the setback of existing primary structures from Blueberry Ridge uh, property lines, and you came up yes. with 20.6 feet. Um, now, when I asked Mr. Fristacci about that five-foot setback reduction in the rear, he was talking about a primary use of that setback reduction for deck. So that's not a primary structure. Correct. So again, he's actually maintaining a 20-foot setback of the primary structure. Is that not correct? Well, I'm not exactly sure, because when I looked on the plan, I couldn't tell uh, before. Well, based on what we've heard preparing. tonight, would you agree right. that? Well, obviously, one of the concerns is that you know any structure has an impact on a neighboring, uh, you know, on a neighbor. Whether it's a deck, you know, if there's a lot of chairs there and a big umbrellas and there's other kind of things, it's kind of like, it's really much more in your face. And granted, we're talking perhaps a, a, a small amount of space, but five feet is important to my people because they already live in a neighborhood that never had the advantages of the type of review that Mr. Fristacci's application is going for, where open space was critical and where these other things were looked at to preserve that. I understand that, but I, the reason I bring this up was on the diagram presented to us here, the accessory structures that exist of the existing homes generally come a lot closer than 20 feet. 
Right, I think there's... So there's uh, that open space is already being impacted by those accessory structures there. Right, right, and I'm not sure if it makes sense to, you know, further exacerbate that condition, you know, and, uh, and, and I defer to you, but um, I think on the diagram, at least that I saw, there were two properties that had accessory structures out of the 10 or so that were compared. And I would suggest, at least in terms of that significant in, uh, impact, uh, ec economic impact, that, that two wouldn't be enough to, you know, allow for that type of accommodation on, under the standards that you, that you folks need to review. Have, have I answered your question? Um, I'm not sure, actually. Okay. If I look at a lot, I guess, the, the Bumstead property, for instance, Mr. Prestash's calculation showed a 15-foot setback of something from the property line, and you show a 25-foot, so I assume it's some kind of accessory structure, maybe a deck that's attached to the house, which is probably very similar to what Mr. Prestashi is proposing on the house that's abutting that property. So right. I don't see that he's proposing anything that's um, any different from what already exists there. I understand. On that particular property, um, Mr. McNeely, if I could defer to Ms. Bumstead, she's the one who did the sure. field work on the uh, actual location of the properties and homes and stuff, I think she'd be the best position to answer your questions or concerns. I, I haven't had a chance to go out and do my audit, if you will. Mr. Crawford, I have one question for you. Certainly, um, Mr. And, and it's, I apologize for even asking, but I was looking at something during a portion of your argument and I was listening out of one ear and reading with my eyes, so I didn't catch all of what you said on one part of, part of your argument. And it was something to the effect that you were referring to language in our ordinance. And based on that language, you reached the conclusion that we couldn't take into account any nonconformities on lots outside of Blueberry Ridge in making a decision here. Um, and I'm sure I didn't hear exactly correctly what you were saying, but if you could. Right. Actually, this is at uh, that page 17 of the, the uh, land use ordinance. Page and it's the last clause, yes, in the definition section. I was, I was looking at this, and it, it defines what a variance is, and it indicates uh, how it can be authorized and what factors can be uh, the subject of a variance. And then it indicates in the final clause that nor shall a variance be granted because of the presence of nonconformities in the zoning district or in a zoning, zoning district. So I, when I read that, it occurred to me what that might mean, and what I think it maybe does mean, is that you can't look at these nonconformities around here solely for the purpose of bolstering the allowance of a variance. And that's the case that's being proposed here tonight. It's unfortunate Mr. Hill is not here to assist to interpret that provision, but... It's a, I, I, it strikes me as an extreme interpretation. Um, it says, granted because of the presence. On the other hand, the, re, the re requirements on us are to look at the adjoining properties and make sure that the proposed variances don't create a situation that's out of character with the adjoining properties. That's correct. And that's... I think that's what we're trying to do. Not, right. Not trying to justify anything because of the adjoining properties. We're trying to make sure we don't prove anything that's out of character with the adjoining properties. I think that's correct, and I think that is probably the task, and that's probably a, a you know a better interpretation of that provision. I, I, I leave it to you as the body that uh, is charged with that to, to uh, interpret it. If I might, uh, if there's any other questions, I'd be happy to address them. But I know the hours getting late and we've spent some time on this already this evening. Well, don't rush because of the hour. We, you waited patiently for your turn and we gave uh, the applicant as much time as, as he needed and we want to make sure that you have the same. Okay. So. And I would uh, turn over to Ms. Bumstead and then if there's anything <coughs> else, I'll uh, jump up here at a later date. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, point of clarification, um, an accessory structure is a detached subordinate building. The principal structure is considered the dwelling unit, breezeway, attached decks, porches, garages. So I just wanted to make that distinction. And you're making that distinction to clarify what statement that was made, Bruce? Uh, 
when Jack was was talking about a deck being an accessory structure, even though it was attached to a principle. I was okay. using the wording that was adopted by the. I just wanted to make that. Okay. Point. All right. Thank you. Would you state your name, please, and address? Good evening. Yes, uh, thank you, and, and thank you for letting me speak this evening. My name is Lee Bumstead. It's B-U-M-S-T-E-D, and I live at 58 Gowdy Street in South Portland. I'm an abutter to the proposed development. I, I submitted a letter to you folks. I'm not sure that everyone had an opportunity to read it, so I thought it might be um, if it's your preference, I can paraphrase from it. Would that be most useful? And try to specifically address some of the things we've been talking about. Um, if, that's, if that's okay with you folks, I'll do that. Um, <clears throat> last week, I had the opportunity to view the application of Mr. Fristashi, and I saw that my house, in which I've lived for 15 years, um, supposedly is only, my rear bedroom window is only 15 feet from my fence. Now that seemed kind of odd because I cut that grass and I maintain those shrubs and I know there's a lot more than 15 feet in there. So I took my tape measure out and it's 26 and a half feet, almost double what was indicated. And um, so that inspired me to go out and with my neighbor's permissions, measure their properties setbacks as well. And in the letter that I've written to you, I indicated the following. By my measurements and calculations, the average rear setback of the 10 homes Mr. Fristashi has selected, and I guess as an aside, by the way, I mean, he has chosen what are probably the smallest setbacks. I mean, there are other neighborhood abutters in Cape Elizabeth, for instance, and they're not included, but I, I chose the same 10 that he did. Okay, uh, using those 10, um, the average rear setback is, if you just include the house, 27.9 feet. I wasn't sure what definitions you folks use, so I worked it out four different ways. If it's uh, the house plus the deck, it's gonna be 25.4, so that would be, I guess, what you're calling principal residence. And I've got, um, which I forgot to put in the letter, but then the rest of it is in the letter which says it's 21.0 feet if you add in the three small utility sheds that sit near the property line of three of my neighbors on Gowdy Street, and if you include the sheds and the rear decks, so basically the most conservative interpretation, you know, the measurement, it comes up to 19.7 feet, which is pretty close to 20 feet, okay? Um, if you're interested, because I found so many errors. Actually, let me point something out. I found this interesting. Um, I was just handed this aerial photograph from the South Portland Assessor's Office. It was used, it's used to draw tax maps with a high degree of accuracy. Can I come up with that work? Or do I have to stay here? Um, to show us the photograph? Yeah. Um, it's the only way we're gonna see it. Okay. Um, I didn't know with your... Represented as, this is what's been represented as my house with just a 15 foot distance away. Um, my garage isn't shown as it cuts back through here and this seems kind of fat and the porch is missing. My house was built in 1939. My understanding is there's been no substantial change to it in the last probably 40 or 50 years. And this is an old aerial photograph apparently, but if you look at it, you'll see this is actually the shape of my house. And it's quite different. So I'm just, I'm concerned that this isn't the basis for establishing setbacks because of the high degree of inaccuracy that's here. And also I found other errors because I did a physical measurement. Um, maybe I should get back there. Well, I think you're also going to need to show this. Show this to everybody. Okay, let's do that. where they've said 15 foot setback, which is wrong, because it's 26 and a half. And then my house is uh, this one right here. So you've got the house here, and then there's got a little, there's a little patio, and then the garage sticks out here. And you'll see this actually lines up pretty closely with my neighbors. You know, it's not that different, but yet the neighbors is shown as a 30 foot setback, and I'm 15. But um, when I measured, it was only about, a, I think it was about a seven foot differential. I can go back and look at my notes. 
So I'm, this, I'm not sure what the source of this information is, but, and I can give you actually, if you'd like, I did prepare a complete list of all the measurements that I made and be happy to give all of you copies. And when you were making your measurements, what were you measuring too? Are there Thanks. stakes there? Sure. Uh, yes. I, I'm fortunate in the sense that I have a fence that it sets at the rear of my property line. It has one of those surveyor's ribbons on it, it has for years, and which I have to assume is, is the edge of the property. And I've been told that my fence does sit at the edge of the property. And so that was very handy in making subsequent measurements. And also I conferred with my neighbors and asked them their knowledge of where their property line was. So I would argue that my measurements are probably within one to two feet of accuracy, which I believe was also Mr. Christachi's thought. Um, because I had the advantage of using a tape measure, of using the surveyor's tapes, and the fact that I have a long, you know, I have a property line that's straight and it's fancy, but I And your rear me measurement came to what? 26 and a half feet, Thank not 15. And after I pass this around, I'm happy to share with you the charts and the numbers that I came up with. It's quite different. So actually, some are just sort of maybe three or four or five feet up, enough to throw off the averages significantly, but not, you know, Second quite to the right top notches. Um, yeah, this would be my notes here. Peterson's has that sort of distinctive L shape to it, so it's easy to spot mm -hmm. mine. Mm -hmm. But you see the garage is moved properly. My garage comes back out, too, like in here. And this porch actually is covered in, in an is that garage? Garage. Is that a recent addition to the garage? No, it's been there, um, I think, since about 1940. I've only been there 15 years myself. What's the date on the photograph? This, I was told, was 1956, so it is an old aerial photograph. But my house, I believe, all the work on it is, you know, predates that. This is supposedly came from the South Portland Processors, right? Yeah. Yeah. Fences, do you know? It looks like the fence actually shows going over the property line a little bit. Ah, okay. So here, I was measuring here, which is This would be my house here, and you can see the shape of my house out. It juts in, there's a little patio there now. It might not have been on the photograph. Yeah. And then the garage comes back out here. Whereas this um, doesn't look like my house at all. It, my house comes out like this, sort of, only it doesn't look like so far back. And then it juts in, out here. So it doesn't really represent reality. Uh, mine was one of the more, was one of the larger deviations, but nevertheless, what I'd like to show you is that my figures, based on going out and measuring. Okay, why don't you, Miss Bumstead, return to the podium, if you would, so we make sure we pick up your comments. <clears throat> what I'd like to do then is give, if you would like, I can give you the copies of the actual measurements that I took to back up the fact that my belief is that if you look at our principal residences of house plus deck, for the 10 properties that were selected, the ones that are probably the ones with the smallest rear setbacks. I'm just addressing rear setbacks, by the way, because I believe that's the area of most concern to the abutters because that's where we're going to lose our privacy. You know, the privacy issue is particularly critical for the backyards. Um, you know, I think that, that's where you go to spend your private time, where you do your gardening, where you expect to enjoy your property is the backyard. So um, let me pass these out to you all. And I'll give a couple of copies to you guys. I apologize not for getting it tonight. I only got these two sooner, but I was out measuring the rain yesterday, and uh, we only got these. Yeah, we only I'll give you a minute to look at those. It's 
So while you're looking at this, I, I, I should point out that the, the drawing that we are discussing and, and the fact that the, the property, the house outlines are incorrect, um, our understanding is it's not been stamped by a surveyor or otherwise, you know, an indication of, of its authenticity as far as the measurements. Should I continue? I, I, no, no, by all means, continue. I just saw some people still reading. I didn't know if, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Are there any questions about the document I've just given you? Well, why don't you continue with your presentation, and okay. when you're completed, we'll ask you any questions. Great, okay. Um, so basically, you know, I've, I've presented that, if you look at principal residence, including the decks, if that's what you use, it would be 25.4 feet on average. Um, all of our homes on Gowdy Street and also the one included in, uh, over on Charlotte, um, with one exception, are at least 22 feet from the rear property line. There is one exception, that's the Petersons. They have a covered seasonal porch, and that is six feet from the line. But if we're looking at this, this notion of significant economic injury and the notion of what's similar in the neighborhood and so forth, in fact, you know, we're beyond 20 feet away from the rear property lines. Um, even, if you count the, even if you count those three sheds, you're at 19.7. So we're, we're at 20 feet. So obviously I would ensure, I would urge the zoning board to ensure that any new houses maintain a distance at least as great in terms of a setback. And you're dealing here with an established neighborhood. It's been here for 60, 70 years. A neighborhood that's surrounded by we're backed by, rather, not surrounded, well, surrounded too, but we're backed by some beautiful oak trees that are probably 70, 80, 90 years old. Um, we've got a lot of maples as well as the pine trees. If we're putting houses and decks and everything else that close, those trees are coming down. It'll really destroy the character of our neighborhood. So there's that. There's the issue of, of our loss of privacy. Um, we're obviously concerned about the blasting, very significant ledge. Uh, some of my neighbors and I are very concerned about stormwater runoff. Um, the property is over 90 feet high. Our properties typically on Gowdy Street are 80. Yeah, that, those are issues that are of planning board concern okay. um, and not something that we as the zoning board uh, can address. I guess I mention the, the trees in particular only because in granting a variance, we lose more trees. We lose more privacy. Well, and I was yeah. referring specifically to the drainage issue, okay. the runoff issue. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, so that was also part of the letter I submitted to you, was just my concern that granting a variance is going to intensify the damage that we would already foresee from having a development next to us. And, and third, in my, my letter to you, um, what I stated was what's before you is not a question of a single oddly shaped house lot, but this is an entire subdivision. I really believe that the developer has a multitude of options for configuring the subdivision that won't require variances and that will cause less harm to the existing neighborhood. Thank you. Are there any questions? Questions from Ms. Bumstead. I am confused a bit. Um, you've provided us the uh, setbacks for the abutting properties. In addition to that, we have Mr. Fristacci's that were included in his application and we have the one which is attached to Mr. Crawford's, and now we have three sets of numbers, mm -hmm. each of which is different. My understanding is that, um, that Mr. Crawford tried to work from the plans that were in Mr. Frustashi's application and worked from measurements of the buildings um, on that, his whereas I was... Don't, his numbers are not parallel to Mr. Frustashi's. There are different... He has a different set of numbers. I as think well. because Rob was looking at principal residences, That's correct. whereas Mr. Fristashi included three sheds that were either right on or very close to the property line, which which brought the uh, the average down some. But also because um, kind of consistently, if you look through the list at Mr. Fristashi's number and then my numbers. Um, you know, what I was coming up with based on my observations of my own rear property line that's well marked and my neighbor's observations of what their knowledge is of their property lines. And many of my neighbors have been here for many years and know, know what their property is. Um, typically, the errors seem to be um, skewed 
Um, so kind of to make it look like we have shorter setbacks than we do. The only exception being that he had Peterson's down for 10, we're at six. And I think if you look at the chart, you might have gotten confused too. I think he flip-flopped Danini and Meyer. I think he meant to put Danini zero and Meyer 30. If you look at his original plans, um, it would seem to indicate that because the Daninis have a um, shed about four feet from the rear property line, and Myers have no auxiliary structures or anything. So I think I was just an error on his summary sheet, but I did reflect that since that was the source I was working from. Okay. Can I just comment a bit on, um, I think this is a great example on the difficulty of uh, trying to eyeball uh, setbacks, and I think a lot of times you see uh, applications here where people go with a tape measure um, and there's a known property line, but people are measuring different, uh, different aspects. And at the data that you provided, I'm not surprised that there are three different numbers. If we look through the list, for example, Mr. I'm pretty sure Mr. Fashasi was considering accessory dwellings or sheds when he put down zero. If you throw those out, he has one that <clears throat> he figures is greater than the numbers that you have measured. And I think if you actually throw out the, the ones where there's people aren't measuring, it's, it's uh, oranges and apples, um, I don't think the difference is tremendously greater. I think it has to do with the difficulty of without having the excesses, the uh, surveyors' plots and doing precise measurements from foundation walls, uh, you can come up with. I wouldn't be surprised if the rest of the neighbors went out and measured their, their uh, setbacks. They would get another set of numbers. If they were another 10 feet off in a different direction, it couldn't be explained because of accessory dwellings. I would be somewhat suspect. I think this just sort of documents the confusion of trying to, to uh, establish setbacks uh, by well, visual cue. I apologize, I guess I'm confused because I, I've tried to give it to you in, in the, the four different ways that you might have asked for it. So I've included or excluded the sheds and so forth. And if you look at the the last column, the house plus shed, mm -hmm. and you come to an average of 21 feet, and Mr. Fishtashi's is 18 feet, comparing that between Mr. Fishtashi's and the house, which is 27.9, I think that's that's a huge huge difference, and I think it can be explained on how you are measuring, how both of you are measuring. I'm not saying. Yeah, and I guess what I'm measuring. confused about is I heard Mr. Fishtashi say something about our setback was six feet. I believe I heard that earlier in the presentation. I don't. He never presented the 18 foot average that I heard. I put. I'm sorry. I, I that is one number that I gave you that wasn't on his original chart. The rest of the numbers, you know, Danini 30, Dyer 0, et cetera, that rest of that column was in his summary chart, which I believe you all have. I can show it to you if you don't. Um, but the 18 is what I came up with. And the point of this exercise, I guess, to my way of looking at it, was that to let you know that we are, we do have a rear setback that averages somewhere between 20 and 28 round numbers depending upon what your definition is. I gave you the most restrictive and the least restrictive. Obviously, I'm, I live there. I would, I would think in terms of 28 feet away. But to be fair, I'm also looking at the most restrictive, which would be a house, counting the house, counting the deck, and counting the shed. And that's where I came up with the 197. And especially where, I, and just to your point about, you know, what the measurements were based on, I mean, I, I just demonstrated to you in at least one example mm -hmm. how truly off they are. My house was off by like 70 percent, you know, 26 and a half feet versus 15. And this tax map showed a garage that doesn't show on here, a porch that wasn't on there. I think it just throws into doubt the accuracy of the documents from which the measurement was taken, whereas I used real life. I was out there with a the tape measure. <laughs> Precisely, but the area photos from 1956, this document's from 1994, and the other document is from August of 2001. And I guess I don't think we can mm. use. Well, it's, it's difficult for you, but let me give you another example. I mean, I live in that house. I know how it's shaped, and it's not shaped like that picture. I'm, and I'm not <laughs> contesting. <laughs> thank you. Any other questions, then? Okay, thank you. Mr. Crawford, um, are you um, sort of directing the flow of the opposition testimony or not? Yes, Mr. Chairman, we'd like now to have Mr. Sawyer make a presentation and he's prepared. 
Okay, thank you. Thank Would you, you tell us your name and address, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is David Sawyer. I live at 10 Charlotte Street, South Portland. And I do have a presentation to make. I, if you allow me to make one comment regarding the setbacks, I'd like to just make the comment that the houses in South Portland, we have a 20-foot setback to our main structure. And we're not allowed to go beyond that. So if you want to compare it to neighborhood structures, if Mr. Fastashi gets his setback to, say, 15 feet, the houses in Cape Elizabeth will be allowed to go 50 to 15 feet. We're not allowed to do that. I mean, there may be ho houses and structures that are there by virtue of having been there before the zoning. But the fact is, we can't do that. And they can. They would be able to. So if you want to compare, I think you should compare what we're allowed to do versus what you may allow them to do on the other side of the line. Uh, the demonstration I would like to do involves the uh, criteria that I understand that you have to consider the, uh, the uh, casting a shadow on an adjacent, adjacent, adjoining lot and also eliminating the privacy of an adjoining property. And um, I would like to request to the chairman if I could just set up my little demonstration. It's going to involve uh, dimming the lights a little bit. It's a very well lit room and I need to use a little bit of light to demonstrate that. Would I be able to set up a table in the center here and just take a few minutes and... and sure, how long will it take to do this? Oh, just two or three minutes. Go ahead. To set it up and then... Go ahead. It's a very brief demonstration, thank you. Um, I'm not. Bruce, are you familiar? Do you know where the light switches are? It's the, the bright lights are controlled in the, in the room. By the, uh, the lights, like for the cameras. Is, uh, is the microphone something that he is, Do we have a portable mic that he can carry over with him? I don't think so. I've never seen one. You can't do that. Okay. I'll do as much as I can here then. I mean, do you, uh, have an a do you have an able assistant who can? Uh... Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. What I was trying to figure out is if, if the existence of a, a closer setback would uh, would uh, cast a shadow on the adjoining lot, very simply. There's, a, there's different factors. I'm getting a little feedback. Let's see if I can hold it down here. You tell me if this doesn't work uh, with the voice. There are different factors involved in doing this. There's the two-dimensional factors. In other words, this is the line that we're talking about between the Fristashi property and the Gowdy Street property. This is Cape Elizabeth, this is South Portland. So I drew the line right there. I also drew another dotted line here, which represents a 20 foot, I call it an average house setback from South Portland. It may be based on what uh, was presented, maybe that's really 25 feet from here to here, but I just said 20 feet for purposes of demonstration. I also, uh, the, the the two big, there's three big variables when you're trying to set up something like this. One variable is, of course, the height of the building. And what I did was I took a typical uh, two-story building, and uh, this, this is actually 30, would, would be scaled to one inch is equal to two feet. This is 36 by 22. So that just happens to be the shape of the box I had. And I took a uh, two-story building, 16-foot height, and this is a 612 roof pitch. 
Uh, this is a typical two-story house. There's a lot of houses that are actually bigger than that. Mr. Pistachi's house, in fact, is larger than this. You'd see a lot of these kind of houses scattered around the neighborhood. So that's why I selected this. So the question, if you're going to talk about shadows, is how high do you make it? I know that Cape Elizabeth has a 35-foot uh, height restriction. That would be ridiculous to use that. And I didn't use a ranch size house, which would be uh, probably likely that somebody would build some of these, so I, I'd use one of these. The other factor, when we talk about where the sun's shining, where the shadow's going to cast, is what is the angle of the sun? And my research on that is that all of us know that in the, in the, in the summertime, the, sun, the noonday sun is pretty much right overhead. It's actually uh, about 70 degrees. It's not exactly 90 degrees. And then in the winter, the, uh, the noonday sun is down to about some 25 degrees on the horizon. So what do you use? And I selected for my demonstration 45 degrees. In the vernal equinox in the spring and in the fall equinox, the, uh, at noon, the sun is at 45 degrees, which would be something like this. In the state of Maine, there's a lot of, there's a lot of time where the, where the sun is below that. So we could, actually could use that, but that's a fairly conservative figure to use. So I just wanted to see what would happen when I placed that at different distances from the property line and to see if it cast a shadow or not. So I'm going to start off at 10 feet. I know that uh, Mr. Pistachi is asking for 15, but he did on, on, on your plan that he submitted on lot 12, he shows a building, and the building is 10 feet from the line. So let's start with that, and then I'll move back from there. Also, I, before I start, too, I want to just put a few people on the scene. These are, uh, these are not typical South Portland residents, but they <laughs> scale out. And, as a matter of fact, Gumby scales out to five and a half feet. So these are adult characters. Give you an idea of the scale. OK, um, let's shine the light down and see what happens. This is our 45 degree angle. Playing all the, with all these, if you want to get to a no shadow situation, you have to get back to about 30 to 35 feet. And then the shadow is just about hitting the line. Can you see that? Now, even if there's some inaccuracies in here, I think it's real clear that if you're down in the between 20 and, and 10 feet, that your, your shadows are casting way over onto the other person's lot. And those people, may, or those little characters there, are standing in the shadow. And unlike trees, these, these lots are fairly well shaded now. But unlike trees they, that lose their leaves in the winter, a building is there all the time and it will cast a shadow. And actually in the winter, it will cast a longer shadow. Any questions about that? Do you know that the sun comes from that? <coughs> Okay, that's the other variable. I, I'm glad you asked that question because I, I missed that point. This line r runs roughly north and south. What the line says, according to the plan that was submitted, was that the line is north 33 degrees, 32 degrees, 
north, 33 degrees, 32 minutes, 57 seconds east. And I have a north arrow drawn like that. You're right that the sun does not come up like this, but instead comes up at, a, at about an angle like this. And uh, if you dim the lights for a second. see that it still casts a similar shadow. It doesn't engulf the whole thing now. But there's no guarantee that the house is going to be at that angle either. The house may, in fact, unless the board decides to, uh, to put a condition on it, the house may be built at that angle too, or this angle. But what I found is it doesn't make too much difference. Instead of having the, the whole 36-foot shadow, you might have a 30-foot shadow because of the angle of the sun. It's only a 30-degree difference between north and south. 33 degree difference. Wouldn't that experiment be affected by the sun not being such a narrow beam and being so close, close to the roof of your house? Um, I don't know. Yes. Yeah, the, sun's at, the sun's at 45 degrees. The peak of the house is 22 feet the way you've described it. And the sun's at 45 degrees. The, sh the shadow, the extent of the shadow on this side of the house will be 22 feet away from the position of the peak of the house, OK? So if the house is like 24 feet deep, then the position of the shadow from the ridge will be 10 feet away from the house, not where you drew it. So you're saying that to get the same effect, you'd have to move the flashlight? By like definition, by defi if the sun's at 45 degrees, by definition, if that ridge is 22 feet, then the shadow of the ridge will be 22 feet away from the position of the ridge. Um, okay. so that well, when I, when I held the light way back, when I held it back here, do you see the, where the shadow is? If I move it up closer, it's in the same spot. I'm, I'm, I'm saying the sun's a, so you have to treat the sun as a point source at an infinite distance, about 45 degrees. Right. And, and the geometry is very simple for that case. As I said, 45 degrees by definition. The base equals the height. The height here is 22 feet, the way you mm -hmm. described it. And the base is going to be the distance where that shadow projects if the sun's at 45 So it w in that case, it would project a shadow on the, the abutting apartment right. property, right. which so is So it would be, if the house was 24 feet deep, I don't know how deep you scaled the house. This is only 22 feet. 22 wow. feet, so, That's so the shadow's going to be uh, like 11 or 13 feet, so 13 feet away from the house. And okay. so it's going to stay on the property. But the abutting property will never see that shadow. Well, I, uh, I disagree with that. Because of the no, I'm just telling you, the geometry is really simple for, yeah. you, you make it more complicated. And I know you don't intend to distort or confuse us, but it's very hard with a, with a large flashlight like that, as close as you are, to really simulate what the sunshine situation is like. Okay? And, and the sunshine situation is really very simple. It's much simpler than the, the way you've described it. Okay, so you're saying that, uh, <clears throat> I'm saying is if you put a point source, which the sun is effectively, it's half a degree wide, it's effectively a point source, at an infinite distance, at an elevation of 45 degrees, and the shadow from that ridge is going to be the same distance from the position of the ridge as the ridge is high. That's the definition of 45 degrees, the base equals the height. In the Pythagorean yeah. That's what you're saying, that if the height is 18 feet, Height is 22 feet, you said. Or 22 so feet. 16 plus 6. Okay. Say, say it's 22 feet. Yeah. This is an isosceles triangle. That's correct. The hypotenuse will be longer than the legs of the hypotenuse. Yeah, but, but the, uh, the base is going to be the same as 22 feet, okay? That's all we care about, the distance on the ground. That's <coughs> okay. 22 feet. Mm -hmm. so, so if you were... So if the house is 22 feet wide, that means it's half width, it's 11 feet, which means the shadow projects another 11 feet beyond that. So if the house were 22 feet tall and it were 15 feet from the line, it would have cast a shadow uh, seven feet onto the other property. No, you cast it four feet inside the property line. It's only going to go 11 feet beyond the house because the position of the shadow is 22 feet beyond the ground position of the base of the, of the ridge of the house. Okay? On center of the house. Right, center of the house. 
So it's 22 feet beyond the position of the center of the house in this direction. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, that was my point, but I, I want to, no matter how it played with it, it always cast a shadow on the other lot. Well, not when it's 45 I, I couldn't make this 45 degrees and have it not cast a shadow on that lot. Well. well I just wanted to let you know. I want to show you that. It, it you may be right. Really won't. Hmm? It won't. It'll cast a shadow in the darkest days of winter when the sun's at a lower angle, but not when it's at 45 degrees. The shadow will all be on the property of the house. Okay. okay. Any questions? Yeah. Mr. Crawford, why don't you take the microphone so you're on the record here? Uh, one, one point that occurred to me is that it wouldn't always be the uh, center of the house that the shadow was off of. It would also be the edge of the house as well. So your same calculation, having an uh, equilateral triangle, would right. take it from whatever the edge of the house site is here. So the 16 feet would come from the edge here at 45 degrees That's as well. True. Right? So if you, had a house that was, if you had a house that was 20 feet, Right. from the line. If this point was any higher than 20 feet, it would cast a shadow. Correct. Correct. Okay. okay. Would uh, the board ever consider, I don't know if it's within the, within the board's purview, to put a limitation on the type of building based on the fact that you could only, exceeding a certain height, would cast a shadow onto the lot? Um. We have the right to impose conditions. Whether that's something that's more properly done by the planning board, right. um, I'm not sure. Okay. I have a, may I ask a question? Uh, Mr. Yep. Sawyer, is it? Yeah. I'll go over here so I can get that. <laughs> the existing track of land is undeveloped, is that? And yes. It's, and it's presently it's treed. Mm -hmm. in, in the, is there a, a shadow that the, that the trees know? Casting on the neighbor is does the the height of the trees now cast shadow on the most neighbor? definitely. As, I'm sorry, I haven't looked at the land. Is it relatively well developed? Uh, it's uh, the, the trees do cast a, a shadow, in, in particularly in the summertime. But in the winter, there's the, with the leaves gone, it's pretty much deciduous forest, and you do get a, quite a bit of sun in the backyards. So this is mostly pine and. and no, it's mostly oak and maple and. A few pine here and there, but it's mostly the hardwood type trees. Okay, thank you. Dave, did you get a building permit for that? <laughs> no, this is uh, my answer to affordable housing. Oh. <laughs> uh, Mr. Sawyer, can I ask what you do for a living so we have some sense of where all this came from? Oh, I, uh, I'm actually a tax assessor for a living. I'm familiar with mapping and so forth. I do have a science degree, too. Yeah. Um, I'm not an engineer. A tax assessor for South Portland? No, the town of Gorham. Gorham. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, at this time, uh, if you'd like to present uh, Mrs. Sawyer. My name is Elizabeth Sawyer, and I live at 10 Charlotte Street in South Portland, and I'm the tax assessor in South Portland. Um, I, I just wanted to um, make a couple of clarifications and points that I think the board should know, and I, I hope you don't think they're irrelevant, but I've been following this uh, proposed different phases of different types of subdivisions um, since I purchased my property, and actually prior, because I purchased my property from a, um, a dear friend who built the house in 1955 and had talked to me a lot about different proposals um, even prior to Joe Frustachi buying, buying this property. Um, and there have always been concerns by, by South Portland residents about how this property on the other side of the um, town's boundary, a city's boundary, was going to be developed and how much of an opportunity uh, the residents there would have to say about it. And it just has, happens to be our misfortune that we, we don't have that say. In fact, we tried to get uh, legislation passed to say that if you have a subdivision that's going to have a, a 
an impact on neighboring properties, as this obviously will, um, that some type of joint review should take place, but we were unsuccessful in that. Um, we've tried to purchase the property on a couple different occasions, made, made attempts to discuss it with Mr. Fristacci. In fact, one thing that I really would like the board to be aware of, and I really hope you don't think this is irrelevant, but just for clarification of some things that have been said, South Portland did discontinue Charlotte Street, it's Charlotte Street, not Charlotte Road, and Edgewood Road after many, many, many meetings and many discussions over many years. Um, and it was not an easy decision on the part of the city of South Portland at all to do this. And what they did was they reserved uh, the discontinued portions of those streets so that they could be accessed by the developer should he wish to come and have a dialogue with this neighborhood and say, what is it that we can do to accommodate you? 20 feet um, is absolutely the minimum that I would accept. And in fact, I really think that if you look at the open space zoning ordinance, it's been described as some kind of an overlay over the RC zone. I don't see it that way. I think that Cape Elizabeth very wisely has set up a cluster subdivision that allows for this innovative uh, housing design to allow for open space for it to be enjoyed by um, the residents of the new subdivision and, and the people who are adjacent to them. But Come, what comes with these trade-offs of, of having the developer have to give away some land that could be developed? You can't just give away land that can't be developed. You have to give away land that could otherwise be developed, but you're not going to do that. And you're, in exchange, you get to reduce your lot sizes, which is a benefit to you as a developer because you have less infrastructure. As Mr. Fristashi pointed out, road costs two, three hundred dollars a foot. I'm sure it's at least that. Um, every foot of road that you build, you need to get a return, and we understand all of that. But what I want you to know is that um, one thing that Mr. Fristashi said tonight, and I, I was never aware of any plan that said 17 lots. The first plan I ever saw for Rosewood 2, which was prior to my buying my property in 1996, was 15 lots. One lot here and 14 lots here. The second plan I saw took this, it was never drawn up, but uh, Mr. Fristashi was told by Ms. O'Meara that that, 15, that 15th lot here wouldn't happen. So there were 14 lots that with this interconnected Charlotte Road and Edgewood Road. There's, four, there's lot 14 right there. When Charlotte Street was first discontinued, it didn't happen at the same time as Edgewood. There were 13 lots then shown almost in exactly the same configuration as what is shown here, only with a hammerhead, exactly the same lot. There has been no attempt whatsoever upon the part of this developer to try to accommodate the, the concerns of these neighbors. And I'm, I'm sorry to, I'm very upset about this, obviously. It's my home and I want to live there uh, forever. This is what we're talking about. We're not talking about this. We're not talking about this. We're talking about, other than, up until two weeks ago, there was, uh, th um, th this is the plan that we're talking about. This is the vacant parcel of land. This is what we're talking, actually, this has already been dedicated to the town of Cape Elizabeth already. So this is what we're talking about, a vacant parcel of land containing roughly uh, 15 acres. Now there's been an addition of, of another half acre with the acquisition of the Lawnsdale lot. But why on earth a developer would need a variance for something that hasn't even been put before the planning board yet? There's been a workshop on this, but now it's my understanding, and this is going to come to some people's real dismay, but the, the road is going to be built right up to the uh, property line, which means Edgewood Road is going to become a through street from Cottage Road to Mitchell Road. And that I have on authority of some notes from the cable is with planner with the engineer. So I just wanted to make that clarification. And something that, um, I'm sorry, I don't know your last name, but you made earlier that really needs to be very, very clear is that plan, there is something seriously wrong with the plan that was submitted to you. 
by Mr. Frustashi. There, there's something, if you look at that aerial photograph, which we'll be happy to submit into evidence to the board, there is something wrong with that plan. That house is not as it's depicted on that lot. And it's not just that Lee was using a measuring tape and she's not a surveyor. There is something, when you're off by that many feet, and when you look at that aerial photograph, and I can assure you, I know that that house is as it ex existed um, in 1956 when that photograph was taken. We can prove that further if you'd like, but there really, that is not a stamped surveyed plan in any way. Um, just one other quick point. I, I, um, I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. It's the first time since 1994 that a actually ever that a South Portland resident has been able to speak at a public meeting because they've all been workshops and in fact two weeks ago the planning board acted on um, a, an amendment to this subdivision plan without a public hearing. We weren't allowed to speak at that meeting either so if you'll forgive me. Just one other quick um, thing. There along Gowdy Street there was mention of you know the houses and how they're configured now there isn't a single there's one house on Gowdy Street that has a two-car garage there is no way that that Mr. Fristashi is going to propose to build a brand new subdivision in this day and age without a two-car garage I can't imagine that happening so I just wanted you to be aware that the width of the lots um, on in South Portland do not allow for a second bay to be added to the garages anywhere except for there was one house that was a double lot at the end. Um, but I think if you do the math and you look at his width of his lots, he can certainly accommodate um, you know, a house of the, of the magnitude that's going to be, um, that's going to go with the a lot of that size. In other words, you can't put the houses of the size that he did on these big lots um, that he's already developed, which this was, this was the original subdivision, and there's plenty of trees and there's plenty of um, setback, 50-foot setbacks. And I, and I just would like you to take a look at this from our perspective, if you possibly could. And this looks like a great plan from Cape Elizabeth. Here are your Cape Elizabeth residents, you know, along here. Who, who is going to object when all the open space is here? Nobody in Cape Elizabeth, but for us, this is a pre-zoning ordinance subdivision that, uh, you know, as, as Rob clearly pointed out, we didn't have the opportunity and the benefit for uh, a planning board review. And there's a reason why zoning uh, came into effect um, in, the, in this state and in this country, and it's because you know, packing people closer together is not necessarily always a good thing. And one other final point, which is, if you read um, your section of the ordinance that talks about building envelopes in the cluster subdivision provision of the open space, which is on page 128 of your zoning ordinance, I think what, this, what they were attempting to do there by saying that the bounds of the building envelope shall be at least 75 feet from the right of way of any road existing prior to June of 97, that's what you're going to be dealing with in the next variance, at least 20 feet from the right of way of the road serving a lot, at least 50 feet from any building envelope on an adjacent lot, and at least 5 feet from any side or rear lot line. That's very awkward language because it tells you you can be five feet away from your side or rear lot line, but you have to be 50 feet from an, a building envelope on an adjacent lot. And I'm not sure, and I, I guess I can only guess as to the intent, intent of that, but I think what was, what was being attempted here was to say, when you get, well, you got to be 75 feet from an existing road, I think that was to protect your visual resources, that you didn't drive down Shore Road and then see a cluster right up against Shore Road. I think that was why they put that 75 feet. You had to build a road in to get to your first building envelope. And I think that the 50 feet from an adjacent lot was talking about an existing lot of, you know, that was already there, that had a house on it, and that, you know, that you don't, exacerbate an already um, very tight uh, subdivision, you would leave open space for that as well. You would leave some buffering for that. And that's just my, my opinion and my interpretation. Um, I thank you very much for your time, and I'm sorry I'm a little wound up tonight. Thank you. Don't run off, Ms. Sawyer. Okay. Just in case there are questions. Um, 
Are there questions for Ms. Sawyer? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Crawford. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hedo, um, we'd like to give you an opportunity to uh, respond to um, any of what you've heard um, in opposition. I appreciate that, and uh, I, what I'll try to do is just touch on a couple of points because I know the hour is late, and I don't want to keep anybody any later than necessary. Um, first, just in terms of uh, what but, Mr. Wait, let me, I don't mean to interrupt, but let me say one thing sure. at this point because it may affect what you do choose to say at this point. Um, the hour is late. That doesn't mean that we can't go longer, and we undoubtedly will. Um, we do have another matter um, to hear. We're not going to take it up tonight, uh, simply sure. because it's too late uh, to do that. Um, my personal thought as I listen to all this and take all this in is that although I have driven the neighborhood, and in fact, I was there Sunday and met Mr. Sawyer on Sunday as I was parked in front of his house. Um, I'd, like to take, I'd like to drive back through the neighborhood again um, in light of some of what I've heard today because what I was looking at Sunday wasn't necessarily some of the issues that I've heard here. I also want to have a chance to read what Mr. Crawford presented to us, which I haven't read at all, um, and I assume that he presented a fairly cogent summary in his oral presentation, but I still, in deference, to him and his clients want to have a chance to read it, as I'm sure the other board members do too. Um, so my inclination is not to have us decide this tonight. Um, I would really prefer not to, simply because I think there's more that I want to sift through in my own mind. Now, I obviously haven't heard from any of the other members of the board as to whether they feel the same way or whether they'd like to go to a conclusion this evening um, on this application. But if the sentiment of the board is um, that they also would like additional time, then it might make sense for you also to have the benefit of that additional time if you want to make a response um, in reply to what you've heard and have more time than the few minutes you've had to collect your thoughts that to permit you to do that at the next hearing rather than this evening. It's, it's a very generous offer. Uh, and perhaps what might make the most sense is if, uh, if the board does make the decision to adjourn for the evening and take this up at a later time, perhaps the most sensible thing would be for me to make uh, my rebuttal argument in writing. And that way, it will be before the board in writing by the time of the next meeting and hopefully won't, won't require any further oral presentation. We'll perhaps streamline the process somewhat. Is, well, is that, that would acceptable? certainly be fine with me. Um, how do the other board members feel about that? Yeah, I, I actually would appreciate the opportunity to have some counsel for ourselves here, too, which we don't have tonight. <clears throat> Dr. Chapmas, Mr. LaPlante, I'm sorry, what did your you thoughts? Say? What did you say? Oh, uh, Mr. Keneally had simply said that he might also like to have the opportunity of legal counsel on behalf of the, uh, the board provide us with some input, perhaps, at the hearing. We're not represented by legal counsel here tonight. I, I agree as well. We've got a lot of information to sift through, and your rebuttal prior to the meeting would be a very good document to have and an opportunity to review as well. Would it be beneficial to the parties involved, if we, I support your, your, your suggestion. Would it be beneficial that if each one of us 
we took a brief moment to indicate some points that we have and concerns so that these could be addressed in this interim period for rebuttal purposes. Um, sure. Uh, I see no reason why I, I see no reason why you can't um, raise concerns to either side about the strength um, or weakness of their argument to give them an opportunity to respond at the next hearing. If, if anybody would like to do that, you're welcome to. They're certainly, you're certainly under no obligation uh, to do that at all. But if there are any questions you want answered, certainly I'm sure either side would be happy to respond to them. Mr. Tranfaglia, what are you, your thought? Um, I think your, your course is a wise one at this, this point. Um, I still have um, the argument there are several, I have more questions than I have answers for, and I'm not quite sure they're for either side. I think they're more directed towards our council, and I, I can feel with the audience here this evening, but I'm not quite certain of the jurisdiction of this board um, for property outside of the town of Cape Wood, uh, in terms of effect. And I uh, still have difficulty with the concept of uh, allowing variances for proposed building envelopes. I know there's a case law, but I'm, but I'm not quite certain that that single case uh, is the last word. And I guess I would, I would like some counsel before we actually decide the question to a variant. Okay, Ms. Miller? mainly because I want to read the opposition that's been filed um, before I formulate more, more questions that have been against theirs. I, I would have more questions. I think it would be unfair because I've really heard one side more thoroughly to um, pose those questions now. But um, I do think that extra time would be beneficial. I think another drive-by would be helpful too. Um, I think we would only benefit from council. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Well, there is also the option of a site walk as well, or a site visit. Um, I just throw that out for discussion if anyone else is interested in Well, I think it's incumbent on all of us to at least be familiar with the neighborhood and the site. Right. Um, and whether you, I, I don't know that we need to do it as a group, but I would encourage each well, I board did, member to take a look at the site um, and the neighborhood. I did it, visit it. Um, from is it Gaudette Street and then ran down through the dead end streets as well. Um, but you can't really get a good appreciation for the property lines and basically that section of the uh, proposal that we're talking about where the proposed development abuts the existing properties. Once again, I'm just throwing it out for discussion if anyone would be interested in perhaps taking a walk through. Well, the worst time to make a decision is when everybody's tired. Um, and the last thing we want to do is rush anybody's presentation. This is obviously important to the applicant. It's obviously important to the um, abutters. Um, whatever decision we make, somebody's not going to be happy. That's the nature of this job. That we can accept. But we just want to make sure that whatever decision we make is as informed um, and the best decision that we can make. Mr. Keneally. Quest, too, uh, along the lines that Dr. Chapman was suggesting. Um, I think the, the focus of contention here is whether there should be a variance on the rear setback. Um, and, I, and I think it's what we need is something to help us make a judgment about whether what's proposed here is consistent or inconsistent with the character of the existing neighborhood across the line in South Portland. Um, we have three sets of numbers before us tonight, <clears throat> one presented by Mr. Frustashi and one and two presented by South Portland people. Um, and there's big, big discrepancies. In fact, Mr. Frustashi's numbers are closer to one of the South Portland people's numbers than the two South Portland people's that close to each other as far as the average setback of primary dwelling. So we, we don't have anything useful to make our decision. And I would recommend to both parties that you do the best you can to provide us better data on this very critical matter. Uh, 
because this is very key to what we're going to make our decision based upon. That's a great comment. And um, Mr. Haddo and Mr. Crawford, I suppose to the extent that the two of you can reach some consensus on what the numbers are um, on the rear setbacks. We can certainly give that a try. Um, you know, you may not be able to agree on it. I, I respect that possibility. But to the extent that together you can find some way to agree upon what those numbers are, I think that would be helpful because it's obviously of, of a concern to some of the members of the board. Richard Manthorn is a registered surveyor. If he can receive permission from the abutters to get the measurements, he will do it. But he needs permission from the abutters to get the, get the uh, setbacks. Okay. Well, that's not something that we can do. No, I'm just asking do, who you to ask them. Sure. Well, we don't have all of the abutters here, um, I don't think. Um, but I th perhaps that's something that Mr. Crawford could help facilitate. Yeah, uh, Rob and I will talk about that, and we'll see if we can work something out on that. Right. And, and we obviously can't send you onto people's property without their consent. <laughs> well, having heard um, what we have, I mean, I think there's a pretty clear consensus as to where we're going tonight. Um, Dr. Chapman, before I continue, did you want to say one more thing? Yeah, I wanted an opportunity to mention a few things, as I suggested. Were you uh, closing the meeting? Um, I was headed that direction. Go ahead. Did you? Go ahead. A uh, few questions that I have that might be relevant to the parties involved is that this application is based on Section 19-7-2-C6, and one thing that stands out to me is the description of the uh, building envelopes uh, 50 feet from any building envelope on an adjacent lot. I think that should be looked at in view of the 20-foot setbacks. Another question I have regarding that uh, is within properties within the proposed subdivision versus properties, and I'm referring to building en envelopes, property to property and proposed, property versus existing, and property versus adjacent <coughs> neighborhood or adjacent city, such as South Portland. I think that should be viewed uh, and, and uh, cleared out. Regarding the abutting property setbacks that was alluded to earlier, it references uh, accessory structures and one terminology that was used in one of these tables was primary structure. Our building code uses or ordinance uses the term principal structure and I'd like clarification uh, of the principal structure. Does that include deck? And maybe that's a very clear answer. I'm sure it is. And how does that relate to the building footprint, which is also a definition in our, our glossary? Does the building footprint include uh, deck area? Does the principal structure include deck area? Accessory structure, you clarified earlier, Mr. Smith, is a detached structure. However, these tables reference all three. Some of them re reference uh, accessory structures which are detached. I'd just like a clarification or uniformity based on one of the earlier uh, suggestions by a board member so that we are able to compare apples to apples in this situation. Um, another thing that I think is of, of issue to me or concern to me is the issuance of a blanket reduction and setback on left, right, and rear sides uh, for a subdivision that is at this point the property lines are not established. Uh, and I guess the briefest example of that is that we have structures that are existing in South Portland. Uh, I don't know whether we have, uh, we do have an existing, uh, 
I may be wrong, an existing Cape Elizabeth structure, maybe I'm, maybe I'm incorrect in stating that. Any existing structure, some of which we know are in South Portland, other of which may be in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, it, for us to issue a variance for a blanket reduction and setback, I would personally like to know which properties these affect and which sides of the properties these affect. So that, that, that relates to my question of a blanket reduction versus a property by property uh, reduction. Um, I think that there might be some merit uh, and I'd like the board's comments on this of a unified board site visit versus an individual so that we could look at this as a group. And, uh, and that might be something that, that we could discuss briefly to see the, the board's opinion on whether we have a uniform site visit. Um, Mr. Smith earlier referenced a distinction between envelope to envelope or envelope versus setback. I'd like clarification on, on that. Maybe some of these issues that are brought up could be brought up to the town attorney in regards to uh, do we have the authority to reduce the setback in view of the statement in C6 that we must maintain at least 50 foot from any building envelope on an adjacent lot. Does that include just the proposed subdivision or does it include the adjacent, as I said earlier, and, uh, and over to South Portland uh, adjacent lots? These are just a few of the issues that, that I think might be clarified in, in the interim. Well, that provides a good starting list. And you would like counsel here at the next um, one? Yes, we would like uh, counsel here on behalf of the board um, at the next hearing to answer questions the board members might have. And that hearing will be a special meeting or will it be November? Well, let's give me the pros and cons on whether we should simply do it at the regularly scheduled time next month or whether we should have a special meeting for that. Why, is there any reason why we wouldn't simply do it at the next regularly scheduled meeting? Not as, I mean, that's general practice, but I, I didn't know if, if you wanted to entertain something else. Um, my inclination would be simply to do it at the next regularly scheduled meeting. And um, to the extent you can encourage people not to put anything else on the agenda for next time, uh, odds are we won't get to it even if it is put on. So um, I would suggest that we um, not add anything new to next month's agenda. We'll work on that. Anything more? It's been raised a couple times about a site visit. Would you it, poll the, the board and, and get a general consensus on whether it's something that should be set up or not? Um, sure. I mean, Dr. Chapman has suggested, and it's and certainly not um, not a bad suggestion that perhaps a, a group site visit um, would be appropriate. Um, you know, personally, I'm comfortable with walking the property. Now, I did not go on to Mr. Fristashi's property. I did not walk through the woods simply because somebody else's property. <laughs> if, you, if you meet as a board, it'll have to be, it'll have to be um, a meeting opened up for this discussion and it'll have to be secretary present taking right. notes. Um, so it is somewhat prohibitive then? Well, once, you, once, you, once the majority meets, then you have to go through the process. It's, it's, it's a formal process. We don't just right. well, show up and bring a sandwich and I decide to do that. it. Um, I'm not suggesting that. I just wanted some discussion yeah. on the matter. Um, it, I'd, um, it, my preference would be that everybody on their own make their way over there and take a look at what they want. Uh, Mr. Fristasi, would you mind if we uh, trampled through your woods, uh, you know, one by one? 
No, I don't mind that you uh, do a site walk individually in the site. Not at all. Okay, thank you. We've marked out a center line from uh, Mitchell Road. Uh, there's stakes that go through the woods. That's a center line of, of Blueberry Road. And I believe we've got Fernwood Lane marked out in, how about Red Oak Drive? No, Red Oak Drive is, is that section right there that services the two houses, the existing houses that are in Cape Elizabeth. Yeah, I mean, I would guess that what we're probably most interested in is the perimeter rather than the center line of the road. But thank you for telling us what stakes we'll be looking at. Is the perimeter clearly marked or unclearly marked? Uh, this perimeter is clearly marked and this one here. By clearly marked, I mean, is every lot corner stake? No, no, you do not have lot corners there. There's a, uh, these identify the uh, South Pole and Cape Elizabeth boundary, but there's not, not individual iron pins along, along Gowdy Street uh, property lines. But you can eyeball down pretty well and, and see pretty much where the properties are. You can take my map and do an eyeball from the, prop, the, the main structure and get an idea where the back of the property ends. Well, all that being I didn't even get a, a, a smile from you people on that one. <laughs> Maybe you didn't hear me clearly. Take my map, <laughs> the one that's 1994, take the main property and eyeball 25 feet, 15 feet, or whatever it might be, and that's the back of the, the property lines. We'll all do that. Mr. Crawford. Well, thank you for that. Okay. Um, I mean, we are, um, it is incumbent upon each of us as board members, anytime we hear um, an application, to do a site visit. Um, individually, we don't do it as a group, but every one of us, presumably, uh, before every hearing has driven by and has at least familiarized themselves with the property, the location, with the application in hand, whatever, at least, you know, from our car seat, if nowhere else, and sometimes from walking around. Um, I mean, we've always understood it to be our obligation to familiarize ourselves. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd be um, more than a little surprised if, as a result of that, we were told by our town council that we should not visit properties and come in here blind um, and rely only upon whatever photographs or maps are presented to us. But um, thank you for the suggestion, and we'll get some advice on that. Um, so, so thank you. Could you mention? the conflict with Mr. Hill and who actually is representing uh, Yes, um, Mr. Hill is not um, our legal counsel for purposes of this case. Um, Mr. Um, Hill 
perceived at least the possibility of a potential conflict, um, and therefore um, the board will be represented by other counsel. And I should point out, um, and you should receive a copy of this letter if you haven't, Mr. Crawford, um, we were presented during the hearing, actually during the break we took, um, about quarter till nine, um, a copy of a letter dated September 19, uh, addressed to Maureen O'Meara, the Cape Elizabeth Town Planner, uh, from Durward Parkinson, of Bergen and Parkinson. Um, he um, apparently has been hired by the town to represent the board with regard to this hearing. Um, and you apparently are unaware of this letter. I'm not aware of the letter. I had heard that Mr. Parkinson may be passed. Well, we'll make sure that you have a copy of this letter. I don't think there's anything in here that lends any insight one way or the other. But you, you should have a copy of it. And um, whether he will be the person who is asked to be here at the next hearing or whether it will be somebody else, I don't know. Mr. Parkinson will be here. Can you make sure that Mr. Crawford has a copy of this? Yep. Thank you. Well, all that having been said, um, can we uh, have a motion to uh, continue um, the hearing on the appeal of Joseph A. Frustasi, 8 Rosewood Drive, tax map U34, Lot 22-4, for rear and side property line variances of five feet from the required 20 feet for lots within the proposed 19 lot Blueberry Ridge subdivision um, to continue the receipt of evidence, argument, um, and the completion of the hearing at our next regularly scheduled meeting. So moved. Uh, motion, Mr. LaPlante, do we have a second? Second. Second, Mr. Tranfaglia. All those, well, first, any discussion on the motion? Um, all those in favor? Opposed? The motion passes and is approved by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. Um, we, that matter is continued. We will not hear the next item on the agenda, um, which is another appeal of Mr. Frustasi. The Last item on our agenda, uh, communications. I am aware of none. Uh, Mr. Smith, any communications that the no, board should know of? There isn't any. Um, then the truly last item on the agenda, adjournment. Do we have a motion for adjournment? So moved. Motion, Mr. Keneally, second. Ms. Miller, all those in favor? We are adjourned. <laughs>